Well, good evening, everybody. How are we doing today? Dave Holdorf here, starting off with our Takeout After Dark Part 5. Good to see everybody here joining in. I see a bunch of names jumping in so far. Along with myself, we have Mr. John Barba. We also have Mr. Rick Mayo also online with us, too. Um, and we may have a few other Takeo personnel coming and going tonight. So uh, good to see everybody there. Let me just get the screen up and running here for you just so we can all be on the same, so to speak, screen, right? There you go. That's what we always like to say. Uh, That's it. Uh, well, doing this here. So, um, so welcome, welcome, welcome to part five of our winter session. So excited to be here um, to, to wrap this up. I, I know John and I and Rick, we've been working hard at these, uh, these last five weeks for webinars, and, and uh, I hope it was useful for all you. Uh, it was it was definitely new stuff for us uh, to to present on, so to speak, and and to create these presentations, and and hopefully it's been worthwhile to everybody here. Now I'm not calling it a day, or I'm not calling it a night, and just saying, all right, let's wrap and 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 let's get out of here. <laughs> By no <laughs> means whatsoever am I talking about that. So, uh, but anyway, so let's get the ball rolling here with winter training part five, and again with our buddy Bruce Campbell in that beautiful red jacket there. You know, the most I, interesting I man in America, I'll tell you what, right there. I, I, I was kind of looking for a red jacket like that today, but I, I just didn't have <laughs> enough time not to spend in the stores. So it was just one of those when I came home from Connecticut, you know, one stop and yeah, no, keep going. So tonight's topic, low, low temperature heat sources and controls. All right. So uh, this is kind of a part two from the part four uh, of that we did last week. So it was. it's going to be a little bit of that continuation, but if you didn't attend last week, that's okay. You can still come and attend this week too. Um, so uh, not a problem with doing that. So with that being said, for those of you that are on social media, please take a look for us. Uh, John and I and the rest of the crew at Takeo uh, spend a lot of time and energy on social media. Um, and, and, we, and we love to see your stuff too. So if you do throw anything out there, you know, with with Takeo on there or whatever it is, even say tonight, Takeo After Dark, do hashtag Takeo After Dark, please. Uh, but also go ahead and tag us. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to keep we're going, we're going to re-resurrect the uh, Monday Night Live. Yes, even though football is over, that's OK. Monday Night Live is now uh, going to be uh, hopefully starting soon. John and I still have to talk about that. Uh, mm -hmm. But usually we do that Monday nights at seven o'clock and we consider it office hours. Um, so you guys have been out there working hard all week and, and you got some questions, uh, come on down. And, uh, we do that on, on Instagram Monday nights, Eastern at seven o'clock, uh, to find us on Instagram, uh, take O comfort, take O underscore comfort is the, is the corporate account. Uh, myself is take O training, no spaces, no dashes. And then John is J Barba underscore take O trainer. Take a look and, and tag us, please do um and get us uh, get us involved if need be and and if you want us uh and of course we're everywhere else uh as well as linkedin facebook youtube uh, uh from the corporate side of things and also uh personally too so we're all over the place out there too so come find us uh, i'll be looking forward to seeing you out there now if this is your first time hanging out with us it may or may not be but maybe first time on uh on, on go to webinar all right things may look a little different to you and if you, just so you can navigate through uh what i want you to look for first is that orange arrow and if it's pointing to the right you're good to go but if it's pointing to the left click on the arrow and your uh your your uh, uh control panel will expand so you can see more information as in to make sure that you can hear us um if there are any handouts and more importantly probably the most important part here is how to communicate with us you guys are all muted out there um so if you want to communicate you want to ask questions you want to answer questions and we highly highly encourage answering questions and asking questions uh is to do that there so for those of you that are there uh that are online and one that you can see two you can hear three let us know it all right and also while you're telling us what's going on out there uh, also, let us know where you're from, too. We also like to see where everybody is from across the country, uh, actually from across North America and or uh, globally at, at that time, too. So so please let us know where you're on. So set that all up. Thank you, Robert. I see that. And Wayne and Dwayne Jefferson. Excellent. Mr. Medeiros. Awesome. We got a Las Vegas checking in. Excellent. St. Louis, Toronto, Vancouver, 
Gotta love it. Gotta love it. Checking in from all over. Love yeah, it. South, South Dakota, Chicago. Excellent. Terrific. All right. Terrific. And of course, the other thing that we like to do too is, you know, treat this like any other training class that you do. So if you were sitting there live in front of us, uh, get yourself a pad and paper, uh, 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 a pad and pen, uh, write some stuff down. And since it is takeaway after dark, get yourself your favorite drink. If you haven't got one so far, I'm sure you have already. Um, Ar Arnie Palmer right here. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Um, and if you are watching, go to webinar on a device, whether it's an iPad, a tablet, uh, or something else right now, or iPhone, things will look a little bit different. So you'll see uh, at the at the bottom left of your screen, it'll say screen, and it'll you'll have to toggle back and forth between, say, the cameras from looking at our lovely faces uh, and the presentation itself. There's your audio section, and then there's your questions. So it will toggle between the three of them, so you can't see all of them at the same time. So uh, with that being said, it's sunny, 24 degrees in Fairbanks, Alaska. Dude, down here on Long Island today, I think it reached about 63. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. And then it's just going to go downhill over the weekend, too. So mm. <laughs> Colorado's getting snow. Nice. Fairbanks. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So the theme of the night. We always love to talk about the theme. We have some fun here tonight and, and get that going. And uh, we decided to pull that classic show out from the 90s, Seinfeld. All right. And gee, I wonder, can anybody guess who's who? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the That's... short, bald guy, so I got to be. <laughs> I'll take so, that. Yeah, we got John as the ringleader here. And uh, yeah, I'm going to take the role of Kramer tonight. Uh, and, and then Rick, yes, you'll, you'll be Costanza. So uh, let's have Tonight. So sure. yeah. <laughs> I'm unemployed, bald, and live with my mother. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> a festivus miracle. That's right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're all working at Cray America this week, by the way. Mm. So yes. <laughs> all right. So let's get to work on nothing. All right. We're done. Everybody have a great one. So we'll see you in the spring for Takeaway After Dark and the Factory Series. I'm kidding. Uh, so let's get talking about our low temperature. Uh, oh, I forgot to change that, JB, like I said. Um, we both forgot it. So mm. anyways, our low, low temperature heat sources and controls. Low, so, low, low. So the first thing we're going to talk about um, is is controlling that lower water temperature. And, you know, up you know, last week we spent a lot of time designing that system for lower temperatures, looking at our heat emitters and using lower water temperature and getting as low as possible if we can, based upon one, the installation, or two, if we're doing that doing a new install. So let's let's base on what was there. So you know, if we look at piping out a system here, one I like to talk about real quick is you know we have a a three temp system here. We have what the boiler is doing, all right? And based upon last week, we looked at a low temperature baseboard, say running at a at 140 degrees, which we saw was very viable for a lot of applications. Um, then we're gonna go with it, say a medium temperature radiant system at around 115, and then a low temp radiant like 100. So that, you know, that low, that medium temp radiant, we're looking at that underfloor with the plates that I ran into last week. Uh, and then we're looking at maybe a slab on grade uh, at 100 degrees or so. Um, and, and as you see it piped here, too, I also want to point out the importance of your cascading down um, in a primary loop here. So here we're just showing, say, a cast iron boiler, whether it's a mod con or cast iron here. But as you, you start working your way down, it's always good to go cascade from higher temperature down to your lower temperatures just to make sure that you still have that high enough temperature uh, for, you know, for that next grouping, so to speak. You wouldn't want to start off with the radiant first and then throw in the uh, the low temp baseboard. We may have to compensate for that and raise the temperatures and and, uh, and stuff. So, um, but I do have a quick question for everybody out there. All right, so right now, if you're looking at our highest temperature throughout our system of 140 degrees, and if this was your, your mod con, you're hanging on the wall boiler, what temperature does the boiler need to make? All right, so that's the question that I have for everybody out there. What's the temperature the boiler needs to be set for? All right, and we see some numbers coming in here. 140, I see, 160, 140. It depends. Thank you, Rich. 
Um, you can always get away by saying it depends. Um, you know, we're seeing seeing some good questions, uh, you know, question mark behind some of it. And actually, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go figure that out. Okay, we're going to go figure out what it is and guess what's involved. Gee, what do you think, John? What's involved in finding it, uh, trying to figure out what that water temperature is, right? I'd say I'd say it's a little math there, Kramer. I think we're going right. to need to. I think you're going to need to do a little math. We're going to do a little bit of math, and based upon, hey, it was uh, uh, two days ago. It was Pi Day, so you know, for those uh, so some of us math math freaks out there, um, I, I know it was Pi Day every day, every time it comes up. So anyway, so yes, we're going to do the math. So. Uh, what we want to need, what we need to know, is also the load. What's our flow rate uh, that we're going to need out to our system? And we figured out already, saying that 140 degrees, uh, and we're going to figure this load at 50, at five gallons a minute, 50,000 BTUs, 20 degree delta T, and understanding what your delta T is going to be too. So, so right now we take a look at it, and I have a typo that was not changed. I, I'm sorry. Hang on a second. Uh, let me go fix that real quick. That's supposed to be a five right there. Let me get that back up again. Sorry. All right. So we know we've got leaving five gallons a minute at 140 degrees going out to that baseboard. And we've got coming back five gallons a minute at 120 degrees. All right. That's our 20 degree delta. So and we got out of the manual that the, the boiler wants to see a minimum of four and a half gallons a minute flow. That's the minimum flow that it wants to see. So uh, we're going to, or required flow rate going through that boiler at four and a half gallons a minute. So we need to know that number also. All right. So we know we got, we pulling up that four and a half gallons a minute coming up and back out into our heating loop here. So let's go calculate that out. So that math will look a little extensive. All right, so what you have is the flow at A times the temperature at A added to the flow at B times the temperature at B equals the flow at C times the temperature at C. Now, what I did here is try to make it a little bit easier for you so you can see where the temperatures and flows are coming from. What is A? What is B? What is C? We've got that little color coded out there for you. So let's take a look at what where we're going to pull those numbers. And we have them all. All right, we do have them all. The only thing we don't know, all right, is the temperature at C, but everything else we have. All right, so let's take a look at A. All right, and A is right here between our two T's. And we know we had five gallons a minute in this loop, all right, in the heating loop. We know we've got four and a half over here. So what's the flow that's going to be here at A? All right, and Renee got it in, excellent. He typed it up right away. I mean, knowing that was doing the math, that was real simple, right? So we need to know the flow and temperature at A. Um, also, what is the temperature, all right? What's that temperature going to be at A? So we've got five gallons a minute on this side, five over here, four and a half this way. So yes, we said it was gonna be a half a gallon a minute there. All right, we need to know the flow and temperature at B, okay? <clears throat> I'm sorry, that's what we needed was the B temperature. I'm, I'm getting it all mixed up in my head, right? Um, so, and we know the flow and temperature at C, right? So we know the uh, uh, what we got going on here. So let's, let's plug all the numbers in. So yes, we're gonna do a little formula here. All right, hang on a second. So let's plug it in. So we're looking at half a gallon a minute times 120. So between the two T's is gonna be 120 because that's, the leftover temperature and that leftover gallonage that was coming back from here, all right? Um, we know C, I mean, I'm sorry, B through the boiler was four and a half gallons, but X is our temperature. Then five times 140 as our supply going out to our system. All right, so again, half a gallon a minute at 120, four and a half gallons a minute through the boiler, five gallons a minute, at 140 degrees that's being fed out to our system all right which gets us down to 60 plus four and a half x equals 700 four and a half x so we subtract out the 60 from both sides so this way we get four and a half and we isolate it so we're going to bring back some of that algebra that we earned learned many years ago all right so now we we uh subtract 60 from both sides so now we have four and a half x to equals 640 in order to isolate isolate the X, what we're going to do now is 
divide everything by four and a half. So four and a half divided by four and a half equals one. So that isolates the X by itself. And then we divide 640 by 4.5 and it comes out to a temperature of 142. So that would be the absolute minimum temperature you would set this uh, boiler to operate on, on a design day, you know, to get 140 degrees going out to our base. But I hope that makes sense for everybody there. So there were a couple of guesses out there that said 145, 150, um, and you would, the system would work just fine. All right. But knowing the math here saying, all right, as long as you, you know, the 140, would it be horrible? if you had it set for 140 degrees when you knew you needed 140 going out. Well, that will depend upon your accuracy that, you know, how much element that you had out there based upon the BTUs per linear foot. And last week that we were doing, we had a little bit of fluctuation. And, you know, we, we had to estimate sometimes on the high side um, or just looking at the columns that we pulled from, uh, we knew we had some extra BTUs per linear foot there. So, um, but yeah. We're looking at that, you know, just doing that math, we can determine that's our that's our temperature that we need out there. So, huh, any questions based on that, JB? I didn't. Uh, I'm not looking really at them too much. Yeah, I've got one here from uh, from Ralph Sprang. Uh, can a can a mod con be run at a lower temp like 120 if the baseboard is sized to provide the heat at a lower temp setting? And yes, that's an easy that's an easy one to answer. Absolutely. You can oh, run yes. it as low as you need to. That's the, one of the beauties of low temperature hydronics is you can set up that mod con uh, to run as low as it needs to. If you have a room that's over radiated, uh, if, if you know if someone did an original installation and they they saw you know the baseboard they, they were running 180 degree water, but they put way too freaking much baseboard in there. Can you uh, can you you know use that to your advantage when uh, when installing a, a replacement boiler with a mod con? Yeah, absolutely. If it if it only needs 120, that. by golly, set it set it down there, yeah. And I highly suggest doing that too. So if you are ever replacing a boiler in somebody's home, um, and we always say, all right, in order to choose that boiler, choose the right size boiler, do your heat load calculation. Just don't stop there. Go back and figure out the radiation that's installed. So this way you can do the reverse, as we showed last week, to figure out what water temperature you do need based upon what's there. Um, so and get it as low as possible. Yes. I would say baseboard at 140, you're doing pretty good because on a design day, yeah, we're looking at that boiler starting to condense. All right, it's not going to condense as much as say at 120 degrees, uh, but it's still uh, doing some good condensing, as you can see here by sending back 120 degrees, blending back in, or a little bit higher than one. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, sending back that 120 back into the boiler, which is great, which would be awesome. That boiler's starting to condense, so awesome, excellent. Thanks for that question. Uh, and, and also for those of you that may be new here too, if you are asking any questions, don't save them for the end. Um, ask them as soon as it comes into your mind, whether it's something that you see on the screen, something that you saw three screens ago. And if you're really, really good with questions, something that's coming up on a screen. That yeah, means those are, those are the great questions. Yes. Those are the great <laughs> questions that you know exactly what's coming next. So, um, so type them in right away. We will make sure that we get to them. And then at the end of the presentation tonight too, we will stay on long on as long as you want us to going through any topic or conversation, whether it was about tonight uh, or even past episodes or anything in general whatsoever. Uh, we'll stay on as long as you guys want us to, if you're still asking questions and still typing stuff in there. Otherwise, John and myself and Rick, we just start talking to ourselves and it starts getting weird. So uh, <laughs> I highly encourage you to please type in some questions to us. <laughs> Anyways, with that being said, all right. So now what do we do for the low temperature radiant floor systems? Because we know we have that boiler set at 142, but now we have two temperature radiant out there, one at, 104, one at 115 and another at 100 degrees. So what we need to do is lower that water temperature and we're going to look at using mixing valves um, to, to get that temperature down lower. And we've got several different designs to your mixing valves. You've got your fixed temperature, your thermostatic that I'm gonna, that I show you here on the right hand side. And then you've got some variable speed, all right? And when we start looking at, I mean, not variable speed, but we're looking at a, a modulating mixing valve, which is now it's motorized and it's going to vary that water temperature based upon an outside temperature. So as the temperature changes outside, it's going to change the supply temperature 
uh, going out to the radiant floor, doing an outdoor reset. All right, we do also offer them in a set point mode, uh, which I might use in, in say a snow melt system um, and, and some radiant floor applications, but I do prefer using an outdoor reset design and everything is self-contained right in this power head. All right, all you need to do is just send a uh, 100, uh, a 24 volt power to this and hook up a couple of sensors and everything is self-contained. So you don't need to buy a, a, a mixing valve uh, with a motor on it and then get another control in order to do that. Everything is built in right to this head here. Um, and uh, we're gonna go through that. Uh, and the the other reasons why to choose one over the other, other is going to be based on performance uh, and also what your flow and what your additional head loss is going to be going through here. So you're looking at um, a, a thermostatic mixing valve here, uh, which has a very high pressure drop. And then when we get to our modulating valves, we're looking at something that's going to be uh, a much lower pressure drop going through it. So, and, you know, fixed, you know, myself personally, when it comes to radiant floors, I prefer to modulate that water temperature. Uh, fixed temperature is great if you always spend the winter when it's really cold out. All right. But even, you know, I mean, yeah, today here on Long Island, there's not much of a demand for heat, but there will be later. Um, but I like to modulate that water temperature. So this way, there's always just a little bit of heat going into those floors rather than just slamming it and dropping back, slamming it and dropping back uh, when we go with our thermostatic uh, style mixing valves. So uh, just so we have a little bit of review. Oh, I just hit something. All right. It's important to consider the uh, the pressure drop through these valves. Now, we start taking a look at the, the CV values of them. When we look at a thermostatic valve, it has a CV of 2.3, all right, which means if I were to flow 2.3 through a three-quarter inch valve, it's going to have one PSI pressure drop or an additional 2.31 foot of head added to our system. So in, in previous takeaway after darks, we've gone over flow and head calculations. So that would be addition to the head loss calculation of the pipe that we've shown you in the past. Now, when we get to the two-way I-valve, that has a CV value of 10.3. Now, that's significant when you stop and look at it that this is the three-quarter inch model. All right, now a three-quarter inch, as we know, is, is uh, as we've shown in previous episodes also, that three-quarter inch pipe is looking at four gallons a minute, typically as our max size, our, our max flow rates, right? Um, but here we can flow 10.3 gallons a minute by the time you see one PSI pressure drop. So by putting the, a two-way valve in, it's like it's not even there. The pressure drop is, is almost non-existent for most of our systems when we're looking at uh, 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 a, a three-quarter inch uh, valve here running four gallons a minute, right? Um, now we look at the three-way I-valve in a union configuration, and that has a CV of 5.8. And I like to talk about that one there just because when I, I like looking at union valves. So if you're looking at the thermostatics, we have unions and we also have the I valves in unions. And when it comes to dropping in your thermostatics, if you are using a thermostatic, and there's several reasons for budget and, and, and other application, but if you feel that you want to get better performance, you could easily just pop out this valve and drop in the I valve right in its place. So the, the spacing all fits in the same. So uh, you can jump and drop it in that way. And then we also offer, ah, darn it, I did it again. And we do also offer the I-valve in a four-way configuration. So uh, what's the difference between a three-way and a four-way? And I've heard John say this many, way, uh, many times <laughs> before, one way. One way. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so here we're looking at a CV value of 7.0 uh, through a three-quarter inch four-way I-valve. All right, so, but you're looking at relatively the same operation with the three of them here. We're just going to pipe them in different configurations uh, in that uh, application wise, right? So, when we jump back in again, here we go. That example that I showed you before, our medium temperature radiant set up at a, uh, and our low temperature. So, we're looking at using that I series mixing valve, all right, when we pipe it into our system. And it has several sensors that you're going to wire to that power head. The first one is going to be outside air temperature. So you want to, these things need to see their own temperature. So even though I have two of them in the system, we need to run two different sensors outside. All right. You can't just piggyback one to the other because then it messes everything up in the readings uh, on the controller. So, but with that being said, 
when you have yourself the box, the sensor box that goes outside, the sensor box itself is a sensor, all right? There's a terminal on there, there's two screws, that is your one temperature sensor, and then there's a space to put in a regular strap-on style. So you can run one box with two sensors in it very easily, all right? So that'll be your outside that's gonna go to both of them. Then we wanna see the supply temperature sensor. So we wanna put that on the supply side feeding out just right after our circulator, uh, drop in that supply sensor. And if you did not have a ModCon boiler, if you were looking at a cast iron boiler here, it does also have a boiler sensor to put on the return side feeding back to the boiler so that we don't condense a non-condensing appliance, all right? And what it'll do is if the water temperature is starting to drop off way too much to the boiler, it will back off and start closing the valve and not a, not pulling as much out of here. And that's if in case, you know, you have some big startup systems, large slabs, ice cold, uh, things like that, where we don't want to send uh, really cold temperatures back into that boiler. So uh, it can easily drop it out easily there. Now, if you are using it with a ModCon boiler, so if you do have a condensing boiler that wants to see that low temperature coming back, you don't need to install the boiler sensor. All right, you can eliminate that from the system altogether and the controller will recognize that sensor's not there and it won't run uh, and look at boiler protection, okay? So you can just not install it. All right, some things coming in. I see some, do I see just comments coming through? Yeah, a couple of questions. One, uh, again, uh, uh, Bob was a little uh, so wondering about uh, the what, what CV actually is. And I hope we answer that uh, CV again. It's the flow. If it's if a valve has a CV rating of five, that means at a flow rate of five gallons a minute through that valve, that valve will impart one psi of pressure drop, and one psi of pressure drop is equal to 2.31 feet ahead. The thing to understand about CV is that it's not a linear relationship. So if I have a valve, if I have a valve with a CV of five, so it's five GPM through that valve, that valve will impart one psi of pressure drop. If the flow rate was 10 through that valve, I, I really pumped it through there. I had I pumped 10 gallons a minute through that valve. The pressure loss is not two psi because it's not a one to one relationship. It's a one to four uh, one to four relationship. The uh, pressure the the CV would uh, the pressure loss would actually be four psi. Okay, if I double if I double the flow, I'll quadruple the pressure loss. And it works the other way as well. So head is head head shoots up like a rocket ship. Not a it's not a straight line. So that's why when you're looking at CV ratings for valves, you want to try to match the CV with the flow rate as best you can. All right. The larger the CV number, the lower the pressure loss. But you want to try to match the flow and the head as best you can, particularly with a motorized mixing valve. You'd like you want to keep them really close because. A motorized mixing valve hunts for the right water temperature and it moves at a, at a very specific speed. Uh, if you oversize that valve, you widen the hunt and it's kind of going, oh, it goes over here. So oh, it's too cold. Oh, it's back here. It's too, it's too warm. Oh, too cold, too warm, too cold. And it'll eventually get there. The smaller the valve, the narrower the hunt in terms of CV. I, I hope that helps, uh, uh, Bob. It's a, it's, a, it's a quick way to, to, to describe a kind of a... It's a kind of a complicated session, but we will talk more about that in the next round of uh, of uh, Takeo After Dark. Yes, we do go into detail with that in one of the classes too. And, and if you really need to find out as soon as quickly, uh, as soon as you as as you can, Bob, uh, let me know. Send shoot me an email, and I can uh, find which Takeo After Dark on the YouTube page and approximately where it is, and I can let you know where that is, uh, information is, uh, so you can watch it. So uh, we've got a couple of. Uh, couple of presentations that we've done with CV. So awesome. Uh, we had another, couple of, another couple of questions here, but uh, uh, how far should the sensor be downstream from the circulator? Typically at least a couple feet. You know, we're looking at at least a foot or so, or maybe two. Uh, so you want to get that, not, the flow will be a little bit less turbulent. You'll get a little more truer read. Okay. Right. Right. And and my little trick too is is if it's you know here we have it on the vertical, um, but if you had pipe on the horizontal, I like to put sensors on the side. All right, get a more mm. accurate water temperature reading there. But again, it's it's you know it's going to get you kind of close to where you need to be. But yeah, maybe not right next to the circulator here like we show in the picture, but a little bit further down so the the water's not turbulent. Correct. Yes. All right, and uh, I think I saw one more. 
I think I did. I'm not sure. I, now I lost all my questions. They went all over the place on me. Yeah. No, I got them right here. Uh, okay. So you can use an eye valve to protect a cast iron boiler uh, um, uh, from causing the boiler, to, from causing uh, flue gas condensation. That's one of the applications of a uh, for a set point uh, of eye valve where you set it up just to maintain a specific temperature and you use it as a for boiler protection. Absolutely. And actually the reset, the reset uh, um, versions also have a, a boiler sensor as well. And that's that's used for boiler protection. You can disable it or enable it. So yeah, absolutely you can. But I wouldn't use it as you as a protection device. That you know, if that's also what you know, the way I heard the question, can I use it as a protection device? Uh, only if you're using it as a low temperature being sent out to your system. There are other devices out there um, that you can use as, say, a bypass valve. So there's thermic bypass valves that you can use also on your cast iron boiler. But if you are using a uh, uh, looking at using an eye valve to lower the water temperature to a specific zone in particular, then yes, it would uh, do that. But the if it starts to sense that cold water coming back here, if you put that boiler sensor on the return, what it does is it starts to shut down the water temperature here. So if the if the calculation is saying, for example, well, I need 110 degrees going out to that zone, um, but I'm too cold coming back to the boiler, well, now you're not gonna get 110 going out there anymore. So if it's always going to be in that situation, then this is not the right device to use. You wanna use, say, a thermic bypass valve. Um, it, which is also a three-way valve, but it doesn't have a power head on it. It's basically a, a, a thermostat sensor, um, a flow valve that you have in your system that'll take care of that. So uh, I hope that's, uh, let's see if that was your question. We also had one of the questions was from Eric Hoffman about uh, why use mixing valves? Uh, why not use like the Takeo? He used the PC702, but I believe he meant the PC705, the variable speed injection mixing control. With a cast iron boiler and you're de dealing with high boiler water temperatures, Eric, I think, yeah, I think that the, 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 the PC705 and variable speed injection mixing will work and work very well. Uh, it's a little bit, you know, it's, you're dealing with you know, multiple pumps, but, it's, but it, it will work really well. With a modulating condensing low temperature boiler, uh, where the temperature of the boiler water is, is a lot closer to the temperature of the water you're mixing, uh, you tend to have to go with bigger pumps and bigger pipe for, in, for injection mixing because you don't have the power of delta T working with you. So in that case, uh, that in those instances, the mixing valve works a lot easier and a lot better and a lot more accurately. And you know you don't need as big of a pump, you don't need as big of a pipe. It can be done. It can be done pretty e easily and economically. And then the advantage there is you're going to be sending wicked low water temperatures back to the boiler and really making it sing and dance and, and condense like crazy. So let me know, yep. let me know if that answers your question, Eric, but that, that was a good one. And since you brought up the word 705, JB, I just want to point out one other thing out there. So those of you that may have used our PC 705s in the past, and, and uh, we still have them, so it's not going anywhere just yet. Um, if you are using it today, the injection pump must be a standard PSC circulator. Yes. All right. Yes. You cannot use an ECM like the 007E or the 15E or the 18E or anything like that. Um, it needs to be a standard 007, so to speak, um, for your injection, your variable speed injection mixing, because of the way that controller uh, chops the sine wave and, and, and sends it out to the circulator itself, we're not doing the same thing uh, when we drive an ECM circulator. So just make sure, uh, just be aware of that. Uh, that's important. So excellent, excellent, excellent questions. I Thank you very much for all of them that are coming through here at the moment. So um, keep them coming. I think I just figured out how I got my questions back. There we go. <laughs> all right. I, I, I clicked on the, 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 for whatever reason, I clicked on the questions and the timing went all over the place. So I didn't know what was where. So anyways, and I just did it again. There we go. <laughs> I, don't worry. I got the questions here. It's tough when you got three screens and you don't know what I'm doing here. So sometimes. All right, so how does the outdoor reset work? What does it know? What kind of information do you need to give it? All right, and with the instructions that come with the I-valve, we're going to have to do a little bit of math to get you to that starting point. Uh, when you look at the controller, and if I jump back, uh, no, yeah, when I jump back a screen here, right on the top of the power head, there's a reset curve. There's a dial that you need to set it up for, and there's a couple of dip switches also on here for for configuring the device to match well for your system. So, but if we take a look at it, here's our outdoor reset curve. 
all right? And there's a couple of things that you need to know. One, your outdoor design temperature, not the coldest that ever gets in your neck of the woods, your outdoor design, all right? We need to know what your mix design is, what water temperature do you need to send out to that radiant floor? We also want to know what is your WWSD, which is our warm weather shutdown, which means once it gets to a certain temperature outside, we don't want to operate anymore. All right. So that could be anywhere between, say, 60 and 70 for some people. And then we want to know what the mixed start temperature is. OK, so as you can see here, we've got a couple of numbers that we're plotting, you know, your outdoor design, your warm weather shutdown. Over here, we're looking at supply water temperature. and what we're going to do is calculate out the reset ratio, all right? And that's the dial that's on the top part of the I-valve itself. In order to find that reset ratio, we take our mixed design temperature, what water temperature you need to send out to the radiant floor, minus your indoor design temperature. For today, we're using 72. Take the indoor design and subtract that from that your outdoor design temperature, all right? So again, mixed design temperature minus 72, then divide that by 72 minus design outdoor temperature. So we take a look at it. Uh, we're gonna say our mixed design was 115, like we said, our outdoor design is 10 above zero. So 115 minus 72 divided by 72 minus 10 gets us 43 over 62, which then says we have a curve of 0.7. So if we were to take a look at this chart that is also comes along with the instructions, uh, we take a look at our point, our 10 degrees above uh, this, uh, and our 115 degree water temperature, and it will operate along this line, which is right between our 0.8 and 0.6 of 0.7. So if you wanted to know what temperature it was when the system was up and running, you got to take a look at this chart because the only time you would know exactly if it was working is if you were there when it was 10 degrees outside. And I'm sure when it's 10 degrees, when it's designed in your neck of the woods, you're not just sitting around doing nothing. You're a little bit busy. So uh, if you are there at the job site, say when it's 30 degrees outside, if you take a look at this chart and pull yourself up to here and then come across, you're looking at, hey, you should be getting around 100 degrees going out to that floor. Now, you could also do a minimum temperature, too. So as that temperature starts to drop off, the control does, the, the, the power head does have, say, a minimum temperature that you want it to operate to. Right now, this is just showing you the curve of 0.7 all the way down to 72 degrees. All right. So at 72 degrees, it's going to send 72 degree water. That may not be warm enough to send out to your radiant floor. You can also set it up for a minimum temperature to send out there so it doesn't it doesn't keep on going all the way down all right i hope that makes sense for everybody uh but it's a real simple device once you know the the 0.7 curve that's it this piece of math right here so what does 0 0.7 mean what 0 0.7 means is the water temperature increases 0.7 of a degree for every one degree drop in outdoor temperature so that's what this reset ratio is it is a ratio between supply water temperature going to your radiant floor to the outside air temperature. So 0.7 degree, a point, a seven tenth of a degree will be risen as the temperature outside drops a degree. So this way it's going to make sure that we send just enough heat going out to the house. All right, we want to make sure we follow that right amount of water temperature um, as the heat loss is increasing. And by doing that, you get a very, very consistent temperature in the house. So your temperature, uh, air temperature doesn't fluctuate as much because if we left it at 110 degrees and it was 45 outside, well, then the air temperature can flywheel a little bit. It gets a little bit above 70 degrees. It shoots up to 72 and then it can drop down to 68 and it, it fluctuates back and forth because you have that radiant floor mass that's heating up. So now if it starts to, you, what we're really trying to do is trying to deliver the same amount of heat that is lost, we're trying to put right back in again, just about BTU for BTU in that system. So hope that makes sense for everybody out there. Hopefully that has cleared up a few things. I think it did. I see, uh, see Nate said that was good. Uh, he, he learned that part there. Awesome. Any other questions, JB? Uh, just a couple of this things to clear up when uh, when guy asked about the 007 being how long it's going to be available, at least 2026. 
that's about all we're prepared to talk about on that uh, at this point. Um, one, if the temperature drops below 10 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, in this example that you just gave, what happens to the water temperature? It just keeps going up the curve. As long as the water temperature is available on the other side, on the boiler side, it'll just keep riding up the curve. That's correct. And you do have a maximum temperature to limit it too. So in case you didn't want 180 degrees going out to your floor, now in our curve here, we wouldn't see it. We, we, if we would go all the way up and we get down to that minus, I guess, 20 degrees outside. It looks like we would send out about 140 degrees out to your floor, which is okay. All right. Which is going to be. So yes, it's not going to stop at 110. It will continue if it does occasionally get colder than that 10 degree outside temperature excellent question thank you very much for that one all righty all right we're getting antsy yes and a couple of other you know so like i said before you have min max supply temperature so that's the dip switches that you have on the side and in the instructions it'll tell you where to put them whether it's on or off and they're all to be defaulted in one position so make sure you flick it that switch to match your system that you need it to do all right, so you've got uh, uh, with the dip switch between 120 or 135 for that return temperature. And like I said, disable it by not installing the sensor whatsoever. Uh, and your warm weather shutdown, we can also turn on and off uh, on the side of that controller. So right there on the power head, it's all built in, nice, simple, sweet control. I love this thing. Love, love, love. <laughs> I, I, anytime you're doing radiant floor heating um, and you have to temper it down from what the boiler's doing, You've got to put one of these things in. And again, John was talking about it before that it works great with mod con boilers. It does work great with cast iron also. It does work with a high temperature system also. So don't even don't worry about that. So all right. Guess what time it is? Is it time for trivia? It is trivia time. And and we ran a little bit of overtime, but that's okay. I think uh, I think everybody's uh, all right with us running a little bit of extra tonight. Uh took a little bit of extra time in the beginning. Um, but our takeaway after dark trivia time is here. So, um, so the question for tonight, Jerry Seinfeld always had lucky shirts throughout the show, uh, but accidentally agreed to wear uh, a certain one for Kramer's girlfriend. And if those of you that remember the episode, she was the low talker. So he had no idea what he was agreeing to. Uh, uh, and he had to wear this, uh, the puffy shirt for a TV interview. However, Brian Gumbel was just making fun of him the entire time for wearing such a shirt. Of course, since he was talking about homelessness and, and all this other stuff uh, going on uh, with, with clothing. Uh, so the trivia question of the night is, what's the TV show that Jerry was being interviewed on? So, and for that, uh, we have uh, our question uh, tonight, our answer, you know, we'll get, we've got our tri a prize package tonight, which is, again, going to be a Bluetooth speaker, which I saw that Eric Hoffman got his hands on one. Uh, he, he's one of our winners and, and loved it on the job site. Uh, by the way, it's not just a Bluetooth speaker. It's also um, a microphone that's built into there, too. So if you happen to be using it on your phone, you can go and answer your phone calls while you're in the boiler room. And I've got the, the famous Takeaway After Dark t-shirts and... I've got some travel mugs. I've got the mini screwdrivers that everybody loves uh, and, and stuff like that. So, John, I will record the answers. Um, Alrighty. Because now we're going to be passing this along to John for the second section. All right. So, uh, <laughs> oh, the humanity. <laughs> and, and I got to tell you, just that some of the guys are saying, I don't know, or I don't know, or I don't want to cheat. All I have to say is life is an open book test, folks. Life is an open book test. It's okay. It's not cheating. Life is an open book test. And I'm going to leave it at that. Now. Yep. With that being said, I mean, when I was in school, uh, one of the things I, re I remember going to a final one day and I was going with my future sister-in-law who was studying to be a teacher. And on our way to finals that day, we were both going to the same community college. Um, I'm carrying all my books and she's got absolutely nothing with her except for a, a couple of pens. And she's like, wait a minute. I thought your test was the same time as mine. I'm like, it is. And she's like, well, what are you doing with all your books? Are you studying? I'm like, no, it's an open book test. I was taking some <laughs> engineering classes. She's like, what do you mean? You get to use your books for class for your final exam? I'm like, yeah. You know, when it comes to engineering classes, it's not all about memorizing the work. It's knowing where to find it. Right. right? So, that, that I, I I've never forgotten that you know I much learned like that from life. one of my professors many years ago yeah much like life all right I'm ready baby all right so 
everybody, it's JB's turn. All right, so oh. I'm going to turn this over to JB. So hello. La, la, la. Okay, can everybody see my screen? I can, sir. All right, this is um, this is uh, going to be kind of exciting. This is going to be kind of exciting. We're going to talk about a new product for Takeo, something that uh, you know you'll be it'll, it'll make its debut. You'll be able to buy it and, and use it um, this summer, not before June. Uh, but it's a new endeavor for us uh, in that we're getting into the, the, the to the world of heat generation. Our core competency, going back over a hundred years, has been in in water distribution. All right moving water, tempering water, mixing water, that, that, those sorts of things, going back for both plumbing and, and for heating in our history. This, is, this marks the first time we're actually getting into heat generation. And what you're looking at is System M. It is an air to water heat pump system. It's not an air to water heat pump. It's an air to water heat pump system. And that system includes uh, the outdoor heat pump unit, which is manufactured by the Glendimplex Company of Germany. They are a 40-year manufacturer of ultra-high quality, uh, really innovative heat pumps and controls. So they're manufacturing the outdoor unit and supplying us with the, the uh, system-wide control strategy and control package. Um, Takeo is uh, utilizing its expertise in water temperature control, water movement control, et cetera. And we are building the packaged indoor unit, which includes your all of your piping, your circul your circulators. It includes a buffer tank with a, uh, an electric immersion heater built in. It includes the overall Dimplex control package, which does a really powerful control strategy that gets the two units to work together expansion tank, air elimination, all the wiring, all done, all set, all ready to go in one unit, okay? It's something that certainly can be field built and has been field built by anybody who's done this sort of work, but in this case, it is packaged for you. So it's wired, it's piped, it's wired, uh, it's warranted, it's tested, and it's ready to go. So it's, it's, it's something very unique for this marketplace. We didn't want to do a Me Too product. We wanted to do something that was unique and uh, basically no other product like it in, in, in the market with its, within its capabilities. So th again, this is kind of a new product for us and we'll be able to answer some of your questions, some of the questions that you're gonna, you, you'll are gonna you probably ask, we may not be able to answer, but we'll do our very best to find out those answers for you. But let's take a look at what this thing is. It is a complete solution. It's a highly efficient air to water heat pump uh, that will provide heating, cooling, and domestic hot water creation in one package system. Now, a lot of folks will say, hey, that outdoor, that indoor unit, isn't that something I could just build, you know, build on site by myself? Absolutely. It is absolutely something that can be built. However, think about it this way. That outdoor unit, okay? You would not think to go out and buy a fan and buy some inverter technology, buy a condenser, buy a, 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 all the different parts and components, the heat exchange, the evaporators, the, all the valves, all the fittings. You wouldn't go think about buying all of those pieces independently, assembling them outside, and then placing the, your homemade unit outside. You wouldn't even consider doing that any more than you would consider going, buy, going and buying a big old hunk of cast iron, some uh, an oil burner and all the different components, the electronic controls, uh, all the different parts and pieces you're likely to find in a in a cast iron boiler or a modulating condensing boiler. Buy those parts and pieces separately, build it yourself, and then install it. No, you're going to buy a finished unit. It, would, it wouldn't occur to you to do it any other way. That's the approach we're taking with the indoor unit. Yes, you could build all that stuff by yourself, but here is an appliance that gets delivered to the job site that essentially cut all of that installation time down in, 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 in at least half, we believe. Uh, in, in, in the, the, way the, the way the world is today where, A, there's more work than anybody knows what to do with, B, there aren't enough skilled technicians to hire to be able to do the work that needs to be done. Anything that can be, uh, anything that will save you time, save you labor is going to be of value. And that's why we have the complete solution, both the packaged outdoor unit, obviously, along with that packaged indoor unit. So let's meet the boxes. Okay, let's meet these boxes. We first have our outdoor heat pump, which we'll show you in a second, and then the indoor unit, which we call the hydro box. All right, they're, they're, they're very, very cool, and they're designed to work together. In fact, they communicate uh, via Cat5 cable, 
And also, in fact, the indoor unit is equipped with internet capabilities. If you run a you run a, an ethernet cable to that, it can be monitored uh, externally online, and you can also use an app on your phone to program and to monitor the to the, the entire system, which again makes it kind of cool. Makes it kind of cool. The outdoor unit, again, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heat pump. It's an air to water heat pump. It's a monoblock system, meaning the refrigerant is um, contained outside. It's factory installed and contained outside. Uh, so your piping from inside to outside will not be for refrigerant, it will be for water. So in cold weather climates, glycol will be a necessity. All right, but but you will not be running refrigerant into the house. So that's a that's a, a in some cases that people some people consider that to be a huge advantage. Other people say, hey, I run refrigerant in the house all the time. It's glycol. I'm not sure about. Well, we'll, we'll teach you how to do the glycol part. All right. Uh, take a look at the outdoor unit. Uh, we have the the heat exchanger. Number one is the big the the the, the air to refrigeration heat exchanger. Then we have a, a a very large oversized fan, single fan. That actually, if I go back real go back one here. You'll see that you cannot see the fan. Uh, the, all the airflow goes to the side. You cannot see the fan. And Dimplex actually does this intentionally. They have studied these things and they have found that if you cannot see the fan moving, you're much less likely to hear it. It's a very quiet, whisper quiet system, but just psychologically, if you don't see it, you won't hear it. So it's, it's kind, of a, kind of a neat thing. I've stood right next to the thing and you really have to stick your hand onto the sides to actually be sure that it is in fact working. So it's very, very, very quiet. Uh, number three item there is a switch box for all your wiring and your, for con your controls. We have an inverter driven compressor as well. Uh, we have a heat exchanger for water to refrigeration as well. And then number six, which we didn't call it out, but it's right here. These are your water connections. These are the piping connections to go into the house uh, and connect to the indoor unit. And again, that will be water. All right, so you will need to you'll, that'll be field done, and you'll need to you'll need to glycol that if you're in if you're in a cold uh, if you're in a cold weather application. So right. So that is the outdoor unit. The indoor unit. JB, let me jump in real quick. Let yeah. Me jump mm -hmm. in real quick. I, I see lots of questions coming oh, through. Boy. So I see oh, a lot boy. of the questions, which I believe will be answered. Uh, as we go through it. And again, we're looking at that 30,000 foot view. We'll have a couple of sweeps, touch and goes, uh, you know, any, any pilots here. Uh, we'll, we'll do a couple of touch and goes and go back up again. It, it, we're only looking at about a half hour here, but I see them, keep typing them in. We will get through all of them tonight. So, but I think we'll answer a bunch of them also. So uh, that, uh, that that's, that's all, John, JB. Okay, yeah, I see a whole bunch of them coming in. So we'll, we will do our very, very best here. To get these uh, decibel wise, you're looking at it's been rated at uh, uh, I think right around 54 decibels, which is just a little bit above a whisper. It's almost like a a, a conversation. It's like almost like hearing a conversation from across the room. It's 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 that low. Our indoor unit again, fully uh, fully complete, fully assembled, and fully wired. Everything is there ready. You just plop it on the ground. You make your piping connections. You bring power to the unit, and and we're good. And I did see a question about the internet. Can the Russians hack it? They'd have to want to, I suppose. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're going to mess up your heat pump, maybe, perhaps. I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, we have our outdoor unit. Again, it's not. It's a nice, clean appliance-looking thing. Right up here in the upper right-hand corner, this is a front view. That's where the touchpad control is. And we're going to go over that in a little bit. That's where the touchpad control lies. The panels can be taken off. All of the panels can be removed if you ever need to service anything inside. So all of those panels are removable. Uh, if you were to look at the upper portion, you'll see uh, we have an expansion tank built in, a high vent, we have air elimination, and we have two circulators, two zero to 10 ECM circulators built in. A third circulator would be field assembled for your, uh, you know, for your heating cooling, uh, based on the needs of the heating cooling units. Um, but the the two circulators internal, one is for one is for uh, to run your glycol to and from the heat pump. The other is to run the glycol to and from the heat from the heat pump to your to an optional indirect water heater and back again. So those are built in and they're operated on a zero to ten volt signal. So that's what we have up top. And again, everything's all insulated and the uh, the wiring is all done for you. And then down below, we have a 20 gallon buffer tank uh, with an electric immersion heater built in, a 6KW electric immersion heater. And the internal controls will automatically kick that on and off as needed. So that is all built in for you as well. 
All righty. So there's the indoor units. And again, some close-ups of the of the pumping, one of the pumping stations. The other pumping station is just on the other side of those pipes. Uh, and then your wiring connections. Uh, you, you bring in some 210, some 120, uh, a little bit of low voltage, and then your um, and then uh, uh, an outdoor sensor, and then a um, and communication then, uh, wire. Your, your, your uh, big pardon? The communication wire between the two units. The communication wire between the two units and your Ethernet cable. Your right. Ethernet connection would come in here as well for for internet. So that's what it's going to look like internally. Again, all done for you, all prepared, and all all uh, all uh, all wired up and tested. Uh, when you're actually piping it up to your system, this unit requires six connections, six piping connections in the hydro box unit, just six piping connections. Everything is pre-assembled or assembled in advance, I guess maybe the best way to say it. Yeah. So it makes that it's yeah, you can't you can't pre-assemble, you can't assemble something before you assemble. It doesn't work that way. But it does help reduce installation time. We've seen estimates of at least 50%. So if it might take you four days to do a complete installation with this, it might just take you two. And if, it, if, 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 if it all works out and you can get this done in two days instead of four, that's a win, win, win for everybody, right? That's a win for the installer because you've got it done in half the time. That gives you two more days to go do something else. It's a win for the installer as well in that, hey, I've, I, if I make the same amount of money whether I get this job done in two days or four days. If I get the job done in two days, I'm making more money per man hour. That's greater productivity. That's more profitability for me. So that's good. And, and again, and, it, and it's a win for the end user and that the job's done in two days instead of four. So it works out for everybody all the way around. Uh, the piping connections are, are as, well, let's do a little breakout here first. Uh, number one, right up here, we have shutoff valves for our six piping connections. Those are all integral. Our two circulators, they're both 0034E ECM variable speed. The heat pump circulators on the right, that is designated as M16 in our control strategy. On the left-hand side, we have the uh, the indirect circulator, and that's designated as M18. Again, both are variable speed, both are controlled on a zero to ten volt uh, by a zero to ten volt signal, so ultimate and variable speededness. Uh, uh, the wiring hub down below that includes internet. All your wiring is done right into that box. Uh, we have a number 30 expansion tank built in, as well as an air separator, 4900 enhanced air separator, built-in relief valve, all of that stuff, the high vent, et cetera. It's all built in for you. The 20-gallon immersion heater, of course, uh, buffer tank with the immersion heater is right there. And then down at the bottom, a built-in drain pan, a drip pan with a drain. So again, completely assembled for you. You could build all this yourself, and that's fine. But instead of taking two, a day or a day plus to build this thing, you could just wheel it out of <laughs> wheel it off the truck plop it into place and then you're done it, hey clarification under your call yes sir um i was told all along and i'm reasonably sure mike can back this up uh that's a 30 gallon buffer tank okay mike uh mike miller from Taco canada is with us 20 gallon or 30 gallon how about between the two somewhere i haven't done you just 30 gallon thank you it's, it's a 30 gallon tank thank you uh, thank you okay. Ray. So that is a 30 gallon tank, not a 20 gallon tank. We'll have to fix that. Very good. Uh, as Alan points out, it's a 20 gallon Canadian tank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the US, it's a 20 gallon. You move it over the quarter, over the border, it becomes a 30 gallon tank. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. That was great. <laughs> All right. Okay, our six piping connections up top. The, the two on the right hand side go to the heat pump, supply and return. Then the two in the middle are for your heating and cooling. And then the two on the left are for your domestic hot water in and out. So again, simplified piping. So pipe up your outdoor unit, pipe up uh, your, your indoor heating connections, and then pipe up your indirect, and, and you're off to the races, okay? It's enough to make uh, Kramer and George very, very happy, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and again, here's a, here's a little piping arrangement for you. If we were to just go to an air handler, okay, to a hot water coil and some duct work, where, you know, instead of a, you know, taking out a furnace and putting in a, 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 a an air to water heat pump, this would and it, with an indirect, this would be your piping arrangement right here. Okay, so the on the, the right hand side, these go to the outdoor unit. The two in the middle, that's for your heating slash cooling. The two on the left are for your indirect. Yeah. And if you wanted to do multi zone heating, same kind of thing. If this was uh, if you had uh, multi zone heating for radiant floor heating, you could do it like this. And then in the summertime, you went to cooling and you wanted to go to that A coil in the ductwork. All right. You can you can do that as well. I mean, it just where this where this pipe goes afterwards. If this pipe just goes from here, it just goes to to an A coil in in some ductwork. 
and use that for cooling. Hey, terrific. Right here, we uh, with, the, with these zone valves, we'll be using that for heating. So, so I do yeah. have to, I do want to point out one thing. If you do have a single circulator feeding the heating and cooling elements throughout the house itself, uh, as we label here as M13, the preferred the preferred circulator to use is something zero to ten, and let the uh, system M control it, because uh, then we will ramp it up and down as C as as needed uh based upon temperatures uh in the system itself um if you have multiple pumps then then you just wire them in as you would any other type of controller uh like you do in the past like an sr panel uh, but if it's one single circulator feeding out to your system like a 0034 e like we have inside um uh, we do have the zero to 10 volt uh terminals to wire to that circulator itself okay very good very good all right um and this is just the internal piping. It's a little bit higgledy-piggledy. I mean, it takes a little bit to kind of understand where everything's going. Uh, but uh, essentially, what we want to do is we want to charge up that uh, charge up the uh, the buffer tank, that 30 gallon buffer tank, as best we can. And then when we're going when we're doing heating and cooling, we will draw from that tank uh, as needed. And then uh, then the control itself will turn on the heat pump to recharge that buffer tank as needed. Uh, in addition, for domestic hot water, we bypass the buffer tank altogether, which is important in the summertime. When you're in cooling mode, we don't want to have to draw down the <laughs> wait, wait to make hot water, uh, domestic hot water, by, by first drawing down the buffer tank. We're simply going to bypass the buffer tank altogether and have the heat pump make make hot water for uh, for your for your indirect domestic hot water heater. Right. So, so basically what happens, and I saw two questions pop in right away when it came from DHW was M16 drops out, M18 takes over. All right. So, um, and therefore we do not flow. So if you're in cooling mode and you have DHW, that was one of our big questions that just came in at the moment. Uh, if you're in cooling mode and we've got chilled water sitting in the buffer tank, what do we do for DHW that we just bypass the, uh, the buffer tank altogether, go straight to the heat pump, and then the heat pump is going to make hot water for us at that point. And then it just switches back when there is no more demand for the DHW uh, terminals. So, um, excellent. Right, yeah, M16 there is, there is will shut priority off. priority to DHW, correct. Right. M16 will shut off. So this pump will shut off here. And if you can follow my mouse, this will be the flow of, of warm water from the heat pump. It'll go like so through M18, through your indirect, come back like so. And go back to the heat pump, so we'll totally bypass the uh, totally bypass the uh, buffer tank at that point. So good, excellent, and yes, I still see tons, tons, and tons of questions coming in here. So we're never going to get off tonight, by the way. <laughs> that's okay. Hey, that's, that's all right. I'm not going anywhere. Yes, we cleared the decks, man. We to totally cleared <laughs> the decks for tonight. Now, work with us on this one. We 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 trying to make sure about yeah, one of the first questions I did see pop up there is how much how much how many BTUs how many BTUs well that's a moving target okay that's that's a moving target taking we're going to take the immersion heater out of the equation right now and there you see your minimum and maximum output curves at different outdoor water temperatures so what I or out I'm not outdoor water but outdoor temperatures so what I did here is I just picked 13 degrees outside, down below, 13 degrees outside. Let's say that's the outdoor temperature, 13 degrees outside. Follow it up to the heat pump's max curve and bang a right. That's telling me I can do just a touch over 28,000 BTUs with just the heat pump alone, 28,000 BTUs. Now, from the sounds of it, that sounds like that ain't much, right? That ain't much. And what if I'm in a really cold, cold area? Like my outdoor design temperature is zero degrees. If my outdoor design temperature was zero, I'd be intersecting, let's see, right about here. And if I bang over to the left, now I'm looking at about 20,000 BTUs. Well, I can't heat anything with 20,000 BTUs, right? We're looking at high performance houses here, number one, but that's not the only way heat pumps work, okay? This is why we have the electric immersion heater in that buffer tank to make sure we can work at low outdoor temperatures. As if you look at this, the heat pump is still capable of extracting heat from the air uh, at outdoor temperatures of around eight below. Okay, it's still capable of extracting BTUs and, and, and transferring those BTUs to the water in order to heat your house down to uh, eight below zero Fahrenheit. All right. Now, 
do we want to work down there? We do have the capability. If it's colder than if it's colder than eight below, the heat the heat pump just doesn't do anything. All right, just doesn't do anything. So you'll need a a secondary form of heat. So you picks and chooses your areas where this thing's going to work. But left to this device right here, just left to the heat pump operation, that um you know that it 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 certainly narrows down your capabilities for heating, right? But let's turn this around and include the electric immersion heater, the 6KW electric immersion heater. And that's that new line way up top. And what that does is it it basically adds 6KW or about, what is it, about 24,000 BTUs, more 20, or less? 20,500, 20,500. 20,500 BTUs to the capabilities of this unit. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at a possible job here. Let's say I've got a job where my outdoor design temperature is five degrees above zero. So I'm putting this in a cold weather area. My outdoor design temperature is five degrees above zero. Now, according to this, to, to, the, to the chart, including the electric immersion heater at five degrees above zero, I now have the ability to deliver up to, in fact, just a wee bit more than 44,000 BTUs. So now that expands my 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 potential market, my potential applications for this for this unit. Now we're talking about uh, we're talking about efficient homes. We're talking about well built homes. We're talking about homes that have been that have on, on, undergone weatherization upgrades, things like that. The you know, the, the 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 better yeah. the built home, the the bigger the home that we can do. Right, the uh, we 1920s were, row home in Brooklyn that hasn't been touched in since 1921. Yeah, <laughs> might not be a good candidate for a heat pump. Right, yeah. might not be a good candidate for a heat pump. But I was talking to Rich McGrath earlier today, and he told me about a, a 5,500 square foot home in Oyster Bay, Long Island, that had been weatherized and upgraded to the point where the heat load of that 5,500 square foot home was 37,000 BTUs. 37,000 BTUs, that, that worked out to less than seven BTUs a square foot. So it's not so much the square foot, it's not so much how cold it, it gets outside, it's kind of the combination of how cold it is outside plus how, what is the actual heat loss of the house. Before you, put, before you go installing a heat pump, I would say an accurate, aggressive heat loss, not a conservative one, not one says, well, I just want to cover my hindquarters. I'm talking about a, a real world heat loss with a blower door test and all the good stuff, doing it right and pushing that envelope as much as you can is going to be, uh, um, it's going to be a requirement, I think, for you to, to, for you to have success with the product like this, because you got to know, you can't guess. When you, you're dealing with outputs like this, you can't guess. You have to know what the load is and you have to apply it properly. And that's how you're going to have success. Now, how much how uh, how much of this, this uh, electric immersion heater am I actually going to use? Well, let's again say say the house the the BTU load of that house was in fact 44,000 BTUs. So this is my heat load. It's it's dead on accurate 44,000 BTUs, and it's five degrees outside. This green line represents the heat load you know characteristic. As it gets warmer out, the heat load goes down, and that's a linear relationship, right? So as the heat load goes down, the as, as the heat load goes down, the heat load will go down as the weather outside gets warmer. As the weather outside gets warmer, I'm going to be getting more BTUs out of my heat pump and I'll be needing less BTUs out of my electric resistance heat. So if you take a look at this triangle right here, that's the amount of time I will be using my electric resistance heat. And at the very beginning, which it looks to be about 20 degrees, once I hit 20 degrees, I'll need very, very little electric resistance heat. As it continues to get colder, I'll need a little bit more, okay? So when I hit my outdoor design temperature of five degrees, I'm getting 24,000 BTUs out of the heat pump. I'll be getting another 20,000 out of my electric resistance heat, all right? So a little bit, little bit less than half and half. So we're getting a little bit more out of the heat pump, and a little bit more than half out of the heat pump, a little bit less than half out of my electric resistance heat, but only when it's really, really cold. Once I hit about 20, 20 degrees, I won't be using the resistance at all. So that's one example. That's one example. Let's take a look at another example. Let's say it was really cold outside. It's a, I'm putting it in. To a, I'm putting it into a, uh, a structure where the heat, the outdoor design temperature is in fact five below zero. Well, I can't use a heat pump when it's five below zero, can I? Well, sure you can, sure you can. 
It's just that we now can't go to a 44,000 BTU load. Our actual our actual load is going to be about 39,500. That's going to be over here. That's my maximum. That's the maximum load that I can deliver with this with this unit. Now again, does that mean it's a, it's a tiny little structure? It depends on the structure, right? It depends on what the heat load of the structure really is. And then I draw that line again, and now you can see my triangle is a little bit bigger, but the electric resistance heat doesn't come on until it's about 12 degrees outside. Then it comes on at, it comes on at 12 degrees, and I'll use that in increasing amounts until I hit my outdoor design temperature of minus five. Okay. So how aggressive can you get with your heat load? How aggressive are do how aggressive do you feel with that heat load? How how weatherized is that house? Have they sealed up the uh, done done the, the the you know re-insulated the attic and sealed it up as best they can, you know, with good good quality windows, weather stripping, et cetera. Weatherize that house as best we can. Made the ductwork as efficient and as proper as possible. What are all of the things that we can do? to button this sucker up so we can make it work. And you'd be surprised how far you can go. Now we've gone with cold weather areas. Let's say we're in Seattle, okay? Seattle, the outdoor design temperature is 23 degrees, or 20, I'm sorry, 23, 24 degrees outside. Now we're looking at, some, at the potential of up to 51,000 BTUs. So again, we have the ability to go to a larger structure if we're designing to the max. And again, our curve tells us we have it. We still have this triangle of using electric resistance heat. Now, just imagine what would a house look like, a 52,000 BTU house look like in Seattle, where the outdoor design temperature is 24 degrees. My guess is it's going to be a pretty good sized shack, all right. And they have the ability to use that. Um, let me know if all this makes sense to you. Any, any, are there any questions on this, Dave? Now may be a good time for us to try to tackle some of them. But what? what <laughs> There's a lot of them out there. <laughs> oh, oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> but nothing about exactly what you got here. But uh, you know, we've got a couple of questions like, what's the COP? And that's coming up real soon, and mm -hmm. uh, and stuff like that. So, and, and we had a question from somebody. Well, where I am or projects that I'm working on, it's minus 35 F outside. You know, yeah, can, no, don't can use this. <laughs> element be upsized. You know, we we have the we have the fixed element that's there. Uh, but if you need more, then yes, and then maybe you are looking at what we call a bivalent situation mm -hmm. where you need a secondary heat source in order to accommodate that. So it might be kind of like what you consider like a preheater. You know, you got something that's going to heat the water up before it feeds into the buffer tank itself or or whatever. There's, there's ways that we can do that that can be done. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I know there was another question that was related to that for a second. And I, I completely lost it that I wanted to answer. Um, yeah, those are the kinds of applications where you know it, it, this heat pump might not be the right one for that application. You, you it'll 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 handle what it can handle, but it can't do more than that. All right, it, it's what it can do the max, but it can't do more than the max. It's just that's just the way it is. So um, you'll 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 whether you do a, a secondary backup type of heat. I know in uh, my house in Minnesota we had a we had an outdoor we had a, a, an air to air heat pump, and um, when it got to below a certain temperature, it couldn't work, and it made clack, clacky noises. It made all kinds of noise. So we had to go back to our to our hydro air package with the, with the boiler, etc. So those are those are things that uh, that that you know that you have to do that you have to to, to make it work. Okay. So anyway, COP again, it depends. COP is a is a uh, is a moving target. Okay, it depends on it depends on on outdoor temperature. It depends on what kind of water temperature you're trying to make, okay, and what are the ratings of the unit. All of these units, uh, one of the things we've learned about the heat pump market is there's no standards on rating COP. You know, you can certainly come up with a COP that makes your unit look like it walks on water, okay? But <laughs> in reality, it doesn't match up to someone else's COP. So you always got to... Uh, uh, one of the things we always tell people is whatever information you get from any manufacturer of any product, whether it's us or anybody else, whether it's on a circulator, whether it's on a control, whether it's on a heat pump, be a critical consumer of that information. Ask questions. All right. If something sounds really cool, ask another question. OK, because it, it, you, you want to make sure you, you're dealing in reality and, and real world information. So COP kind of depends on the outdoor temperature and what you're asking the heat pump to do. So according to this chart, uh, if, if the outdoor temperature is you know around zero, 
we'll have a COP of about two and a half. Okay, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. If we were below zero at minus five, we're about two and a quarter. Okay, if we move this thing to Seattle, all right, and we're at 23 or 24 degrees outdoor temperature, now the COP bumps up to four for heating. Now, I could tell you that at 60, I'd say at 70 degrees, I got a COP of eight. Or I could just tell you, I have a COP of eight. If I just told you I had a COP of eight, wouldn't you say, ha, prove that, pal. I want to see the math behind that. Or would you say, that's cool. That's the one I'm using. That's the most efficient. You obviously have to be, a, again, a critical consumer of information. At what temperature are we really talking about? And in, in terms of, a, of, a, of an air-to-water heat pump, we're looking at what water temperature can we create uh, and th and then do we have to we have to design around that water temperature to get the max COP. So again, it varies. 47 degrees Fahrenheit outside. So one one uh, air we we we've given you uh, COPs and outputs at different water temperatures at different outdoor temperatures. So in this case, 105 degree water, we're looking at about 30,000 BTUs, a little less than 30,000 BTUs with a COP of 4.38. If instead we were making 120 degree water, all right, COP of three and a half, and 140 degree water, COP of 2.6. So again, what water temperature are we making at different outdoor air temperatures? If we went down to 17 degrees, you can see the output goes down because again, it's warm. I'm, I'm dealing with colder air. I'm trying to extract heat from colder air, and you can see the COPs go down as well. 2.76, 2.33 down to 1.85 if I'm trying to make 140 degree water. One thing this should tell you is that everything we talked about last week, designing your system to get that water temperature as low as possible is going to have tremendous benefits in terms of how efficiently and how effectively uh, the heat pump can run. None of this is to say you should, you should be okay. You can do 140 degree water out of this heat pump, but you're using an awful, as it gets colder, you're gonna use an awful lot of electricity and your efficiency goes down. If it is possible for you to design to 120, 110, 105, you're going to be rewarded with greater and greater efficiency. Right, So, and, and as Bob just mentioned too, you know, those COPs that we're looking at there are still higher than fossil fuels. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Fossil, fossil fuels are fractional. And, no, not, and, and, uh, and Tom also brought up, so no, it does not include the immersion element. Correct. Right. Right. This is just the heat pump working by itself. Yep. yep. This is just the heat pump. All righty. And then if I'm go at, at, at if it goes really low, our rating at five degrees, I can make 110 degree water, 17,880 BTUs at 110 degree water, 2.2 COP, which again isn't bad. <laughs> it really isn't bad at all. So it's like for every dollar of energy you feed it, it gives you two dollars and twenty cents worth of heat. Is that right? Cooling is the same thing, only different. It's just it's it's the same same curve, just backwards. Okay? The curve falls the other way, right? Yep. Yeah, the curve falls the other way. As it gets warmer out, my capacity in terms of tons goes down. So at 80 degrees outside, uh, I could I could uh, have a three and a half ton system. At 95, it's a, I could do three tons. At 105, I can do two and a half. Okay, and our EER energy efficiency ratio anywhere from two to 2.8 in terms of in terms of efficiency on that. So again, it's what we can do. It's what we can do. And then lastly, oh boy, there's a lot of good, I can see the questions here all over the place. So we're gonna have to uh, go, over the, go over the control interface and then we want to, uh, then we're gonna wanna, uh, we'll start attacking these questions as best we can. Um, the human, the ultimate human interface or universal human interface or UHI, it's the touch panel, the control. All information is, uh, is accessible through that control panel, all right? And it's a touch screen and it has some lockout so homeowners can look at it, but they can't get into it and reprogram it, okay? They can look at certain things, but there's only minimal damage they can do. Unless, the other, unless they have full access to it, which they may, you know? You so may, as long, it, as, yep. as, it, long it, as if they start messing with things and they change it and it doesn't work again and you have to come back and adjust it, or at least monitor it remotely, make sure you get paid for your knowledge on that on that side of things too, right? It's a service mm -hmm. charge, right? Yeah. It's just anything else, 
uh, on there. So one, I want to point out that picture on the le bottom left-hand corner that you're looking at there, this is on the unit itself. So the unit itself has this touch screen. And, and John and I kind of nicknamed this the ultimate human interface. Uh, but we do, uh, 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 corporately, the, uh, the engineers have called it the universal human interface. So, But we messed around with it for a little bit and said, yeah, this is ultimate human interface. Yeah, the oh, UHI, yeah. Is, it, it's, it's really, really neat, man. Yeah, yeah most, most definitely ultimate, most definitely ultimate. Uh, there are, there's two levels of, of, uh, of activity or two levels of accessibility. Uh, there's there's just the the system basic system M and then there's the installer uh, installer mode where you can get into some heavy access programming. Additionally, the reason this thing is connected to the to the internet via Ethernet is that you will be able to access each individual unit you install anywhere on the globe using your phone, okay, or a laptop or whatever. I mean, you'll you'll have that ability, and we will have the ability to monitor operation and help with troubleshooting as well on uh, via computer. So that's kind of a of a next level kind of control that we're that we're working on. So again, we're gonna we're gonna walk you through a little um, just a just a demo uh, of a real basic demo of what this thing can do. And I'm just gonna take you to the internet here. And when you're online, this is a this is just a simulation of uh, of what we of what we have here. This is just a basic simulation. And the simulation right now is reading in centigrade. But when you walk up to the unit, you're gonna see a clock just like this. It'll tell you the time. And if you wanna do something with it, you have to click. And then you draw the unlock pattern. To get to the homeowner level, you start down here in the lower left-hand corner and you draw yourself an M. And now you get into the control panel. And you can click on that, uh, that little red little red uh, dot and it tells you no remote access to date, meaning nobody's accessed this, this thing with their phone. Okay, and it also tells you what the different insignias are, or different uh, 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 icons are for. We have home, settings, and analytics. And this is your basic, you don't need a password or anything for this. So if I wanna look at the home screen, what I'll do is I'll put my finger on the little house and just swipe left. So it's sort of like, it, this is sort of like heat pump Tinder, if you will. Just swipe left and you'll get what you want. Um, and what this does is it gives you four little four little uh, um, uh, blocks to see what's going on. So system status, if we clicked on system status, it tells us uh, a couple of different utility blocks, okay? There's a block from the utility company. The utility block can last up to two hours if the, utilities, if the utility has access to turn things on and off. You have, you have all those available to you, all right? If we look at operating mode, okay, we go here to operating mode. Do we want automatic or manual? Are we only in domestic hot water? Do we want heating operation, only heating element or, or cooling operation? So you have choices to make to make here. So you do automatic or manual for operating modes. Domestic hot water, it'll tell you what your target temperature is and what your actual temperature is. And you can, you, you can, adjust as needed if you want that water hotter okay you can do it that way and again this is this is these are in degrees c at this point uh and then the heating and cooling circuit okay if you actually look at this it tells you what the current outdoor temperature is and what the system return water temperature is the whole thing operates on system return temperature so with all the sensors it'll tell you what the return water temperatures are and that's how it kind of knows what to do uh, and then I can change my the system return. What's the target? I can change all these different things. Okay. So that is the that's the home screen. Now let's go to analytics. If you go over here, again it just tells you, it, run, it gives you basic information. So control functions for your pump. Um, how do you want the, these different uh, things controlled? Heating circuit, uh, heat, heat pump circuit, heat pump circulating pump m16 heating and cooling circuit pump m13 okay that's the the um uh the the heating circulator that you would install do you want the unit to control that you would enable it here domestic hot water circulator outdoor fan etc um so you get all the you schedule maintenance inputs and outputs are available here you can find out what's going on outside uh and all these different all these different units um, you can uh, look at run times and cycle counts. These are all good things to know as well. Uh, so again, a lot of different, a lot of good basic information here. And then for settings, again, you can check your network. Are you are you hooked up to your network? Uh, 
HCC heating cooling circuit system profiles. Okay, this is where you're going to see where you know how this thing has been set up for you. All right. So you got a lot of different things that you can look at here. You can change the font if you want. I mean, you can do all kinds of silly, you know, silly crazy things with this. Now, if I want to go into the installer mode, all right. If I want to go into the installer mode, I'll click on this and then I just do an I. And I is my installer mode, and then I have to put in my password. In this case, it's just system M for the example. And now I see the little toolbox down below, and now I have my programming okay, system set up. If you're doing just simple uh, 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 an air coil in, in your ductwork, and it's going to be forced air heat and forced air cooling, it's very simple. This easy on setup is about as simple as you can make it. You just go to manage your configurations. It, it, you, it saves all the possible, all the previous configurations you have. If you don't have anything, you simply create a new one and then you start to, then you work from there. Okay. And then these little dots here allow you to uh, 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 check your different values for your settings, et cetera. So my immersion heater, et cetera, do I need to change that or do I leave it as, as, as it is? Um, Okay, I can continue and get into other programming, heating and dynamic cooling. I can do heating, heating and dynamic cooling, or di just dynamic cooling, depending on what I need. Um, and then continue, fixed set point for, for cooling operations, fixed set point is actually pretty good for heat. Uh, if you're doing a, you know, you're, you're, if you're doing a, a forced air with a hot water coil, your fixed set point is, is good. They talked about, uh, we talked about uh, doing weather compensation, which is basically outdoor reset if you're just doing uh, forced air heating and cooling. And we found that the benefit of doing weather compensation at that point is rather minimal. So leaving it at fixed set point was good. If you're doing other kinds of hydronic heating, like radiant floor heating, panel radiators, things like that, then you'd want to go into the weather compensation mode for your heating to control your heating circuit. And then you just continue your, your different set point temperatures, et cetera. And by the time you're done with all the basic, basic setup, it's pretty simple. Okay, smart grid has to do with uh, how you interact with the utility. Uh, does the utility have the ability to go shut your unit off at any given point in time? Then you, you, that's a yes or no. If you want them to have that, if they make a deal with you for that, that's that's how you would you would use that that particular thing. Yeah, that that'll depend upon what part of the country you're in. If you have smart grid technology uh, available to you, and you get some incentives for connecting to the smart grid, so uh, we have that capabilities also built into uh, uh, the unit itself. So uh, if if you know about smart grid, then you've got it in your neck of the woods. Uh, if you don't know about smart grid, then you don't have it in your neck of the woods. <laughs> right, there you as go. As simple as that, yeah, yep. And then once you're done, you can you create a commissioning protocol report that you can email to yourself, uh, so you know how this, you can save on how the, 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 the setup of this particular unit, and um, you'll have that, you'll have that data with you. So in case anybody goes to, uh, goes to change it, then we're okay. We create our commissioning report, et cetera, so. There you go. That's about as much as we're prepared to really get into the, the controlling of it. We just wanted to share it with you if we could. So you guys had an idea of what it was like, what was what its capabilities were. There's a, the capabilities here are a lot deeper. Once we get into, uh, uh, you know, different temperature types of hydronics, uh, whether it's baseboard or radiators or radiant floor heating, man, this thing can do some pretty cool stuff. But I just wanted to give you a sense of what it can do, what it's capable of doing, and a feel for the control panel. The control can do some pretty cool stuff as well. So with that, we should probably get to the questions, huh? Or should we do the trivia? Then we'll get to the questions because there's a lot of questions here, man, right? Yes, there was. See, yes, correct. Yeah, I do see one from Bob Clark. Are any provision for a dirt mag separator? Yes. You would always install one on the return side from your from your heating. Uh, we did show that in one of the pictures, I think, uh, a dirt mag separator installed in your return piping before it goes into the indoor unit. So I think you would definitely install one there. All right, are we ready, Dave? I am ready, my man. Okay, we're gonna answer the trivia question and then we're gonna answer your questions, but boy, oh boy, do you have a ton of them. Uh, here we go. So Brian Gumbel, or Gumball, as it says here, is interviewing Jerry but can't get through the interview without making fun of the puffy shirt, right? What was the TV show that Jerry was being interviewed on? What was it, Dave? It was the Today Show. It was the Today and Show. See by the picture there, yes. And Jerry says, I don't want to be a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> 
So that uh, is the yes, Today yes, Show. Yes. So very good. I'm guessing we had a whole bunch of right answers there, right? We did have a, quite a few bun, uh, quite a few right answers out there tonight. So yes, thank you everybody that did answer uh, and 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 played and have some fun with us too. I, I hope you all had fun, and I and I hope the themes. You know, uh, just bring back some nostalgia for some of you that, you know, grew up on these shows or if you're watching them on reruns and Netflix and all that jazz out there nowadays. You know, those of us like me that, you know, couldn't wait till Thursday night to watch all these shows, you know, because that's what that was the power night to watch them. So, um, you know, instead of stream, you know, instead of uh, Netflix and chill for a couple of hours. So uh, I had fun doing them. You know, we had John and I have fun making these presentations with the themes behind it. Uh, you know what, while we're building them, and then all of a sudden you just find that perfect picture, you know, and you're sitting here in your office by yourself laughing your ass off. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it kind of makes it worth it, I think, you know, um, especially when you pull out some of these old shows like that. So uh, yeah. I, I had fun. I had fun creating this one tonight. So uh, again, good. thank you for laughing along with us when you saw something funny pop up on the screen. So. All right. And just to, just before we get to the, the, the spinning wheel and the rest of your questions, uh, take go after dark. We'll, uh, this is our this is our last one for the winter uh, for the for the uh, for the winter mode or for the winter sessions. Uh, we're going to start the spring session April 20th, Wednesday night April 20th, and we're going to be doing the eight week Takeo Factory training program. So if you've ever wanted to come to the Takeo Factory training but couldn't make it to Cranston for the three, for the two days, we're going to give it to you one slice at a time, one hour at a time over eight weeks starting on April 20th. So we'll be ha we'd love to have you come and join us if you haven't been through it before. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more about the, about the, the system M throughout this program as well. So, uh, that'll be a good time. So, uh, keep your eyes and ears open for that, uh, both from us and mechanical hub and that'll start on April 20th. So there it is. There it is. Dave, I'm going to give it back to you for the spinny spinny. Excellent. Right. Thank you. All right. There you go. All right, are we ready to rock and roll? All right, we got it up there with Kramerica tonight. Kramerica, beautiful. <laughs> All right, so for the grand prize, which is the Bluetooth speaker and the coffee mug and the T-shirt and the everything else or, or whatever accessories I've got down in the basement itself, um, will be sent out to our grand prize winner. So, with based on that, let's see who that will be. And it's spinning and it's going and is it stopping? Is it going? And it's on David. Excellent. Excellent name there, bro. All right. You are my grand prize winner. I have your information on your shirt size and hopefully your address too, if you registered with that. So uh, I hope to get them out this week is, is my goal. Uh, I know I have a couple of weeks worth right now. The last two and a half weeks I've got to get out. So um, hopefully things will be leaving soon because it's not just the grand prize uh that we're going to give away we've got a few more t-shirts and for those of you that joined us tonight i am so happy with that um so we're going to give away a few more t-shirts how about how about what do you think four, four let's more give shirts. away four more t-shirts yeah i like take four more t-shirts which i believe rickster is wearing he may be wearing the take away the dark t-shirt tonight i was getting a little prepared for saint patty's day tomorrow so time for some shenanigans you know? <laughs> oh he's got the dress he's got the golf shirt on there but very similar is the takeo uh takeo at the dark t-shirt so let's get hold away on i'll grab mine things. hold on a second all right so as we do this let's see our next one is dr renee excellent dr renee. renee has been on so many of these and i don't know if he won any t-shirts from us in the past so that is is awesome right there i didn't type out the rest of your name because I think you're the only one that has registered as Dr. Renee. So thank you very much for attending also for a lot of these. Um, so here is our Takeo After Dark t-shirt. We got Takeo on the sleeve, the little logo up front and the big logo on back. So everybody knows who you are and what you stand for. All right, and it looks like we got Matt. Excellent. Congratulations, Matt. Matt. Way to go. Woohoo! And hopefully I don't offend you by calling you Matt, because I know you typed it in as Matthew, but there was a lot of names up there. So I just had to start uh, abbreviating a little bit there. So excellent. Thank you very much. All right. Our next winner going to be as that wheel keeps spinning there. All right. Looks like it's going to be on Gene. Excellent. Thank you. And our last spin of the night.
And the last one in, the last answer that we got in was Dan. He got it in under the wire. All right, Dan Dearden. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. He all of a sudden remembered it was literally about five minutes ago. He's like, oh, he had to type that one in there. <laughs> Excellent, Congrats, Dan. Excellent. Way to be. All right. Okay. How far back do we go with these questions? Let's see what we can what we can oh, do. Oh my goodness! Yeah, it, it, there were a lot of questions coming through. We may have answered half of them. Uh, I hope we did. And and there will be some questions, and and we'll honestly going to say we don't have the answer to. All right, or we just don't know when. You know, there's there's things of when it's coming, and uh, or this or that, or or or, or information more to have. Um, it'll be coming out as soon as we can. So John and I wanted to give you guys all, like you said, a teaser. Uh, it's coming mm -hmm. out later this year, sometime this summer. Uh, we do know that a uh, applica uh, uh, product will be coming uh, and be made available, but things will be coming uh, in the future itself. So and, uh, let's uh, let's invite Mike Mike Miller if you want to turn on your webcam and join us too. This would be this would be an awesome time for you to be part of this discussion as well. Uh, Mike's, uh, uh, Mike is the head honcho of Takeo of Canada and uh, uh, was one of the is one of the prime movers behind the uh, the the system M uh, program and if if the three of us don't have an answer Mike may. <laughs> so there's Mike. Mike's one of the smarter Mike is one of the smarter people that I know. I, he's not quite as smart as Rick Mayo. <laughs> I've been having your guys' company. <laughs> I, I learned almost everything I know from Mike Miller, so I'd have to disagree. <laughs> almost, you said. Almost. All right. All right. Well, I got a couple of questions. I got a couple of questions lined up here. Uh, I just I saw one. Uh, how noisy is the indoor unit? Well, the indoor unit is virtually silent because the only thing that really moves are the pumps, and the pumps don't make any noise at all. You know, they're about. Uh, but the, those 0034s, they're in the 35 to 40 decibel range, I think. And because they're variable speed, they're going to spend a lot of time at really low speed. So the indoor unit doesn't make any noise at all. And let's see what else let's, we have yeah, here. Whatever the noise is of a 0034, that's running on a 0 to 10 signal. So it's a variable speed pump. So it's going to be quiet for a very large portion of the time itself. So exactly, yeah. Um, I'd have to look up what the decibel level is of a 0034, but I don't think it's much. <laughs> what about the noise of the outdoor unit? Yeah, the noise of the outdoor unit, we rate it at 54 decibels. And again, if you can't see the fan, you can't hear the fan. Uh, and so again, when we were down down in Florida uh, uh, working on one that was installed down there and it was running when it was pretty hot out, it I was within five feet of it and I really, honest to God, didn't hear anything. But you, you could stick your hand over there and you could feel the air moving, but that was about it. One of the reasons they're asking those questions is, um, I believe it was the Northwest at Ashray. They were actually telling us there's a there's a threshold you can't be above if you have right. something that's outdoors. So, uh, and I think we were well under that threshold. I can't remember what it. Mike, do you I, recall what that was in like Seattle or uh, Oregon and that area? It would probably have to be near to 60 because a traditional AC unit is in the 70 range. And uh, for that, some jurisdiction actually won't allow you to put one of those units in between buildings. You can have it in front of the house or behind the house. But with this unit, I got one literally like, uh, Rick, you've been at my house and you parked up uh, one, was one of the pictures uh, you showed earlier. I'm yeah. literally like five feet away from my neighbor and he can't hear my unit. Yeah. He can hear yeah. my mother-in-law talk inside the kitchen, but he can't hear <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> Right. And I'm don't forget that, I can hear your mother-in-law, Mike. I, <laughs> and and I, don't forget that 54 decibels is when it's running full bore. Right. 100%. Right. And with everything being variable speed, it's probably not going to be nowhere near that, you know, 75% of the time. Right. Yep. Uh, the, I think that, I think the, the, the uh, if, I, if I recall correctly, that the, the, the Pacific Northwest threshold was, I think, about 64, 65 BTUs, or BTUs, decibels, rather. 64, 65 decibels. So we're obviously well below that. Very good, very good. So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of great questions here. I'm moving backwards. Uh, how much efficiency is lost with glycol? Uh, you're not going to necessarily lose efficiency. It doesn't. I mean, it's not as good of a transfer heat transfer medium, but you make up for that with 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 you know slightly higher GPM. Okay, so your circulate you, you'll find that if you do your GPM divide equals GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times whatever number you multiply by, 
uh, with uh, your glycol percentage, let's say it's a 30% glycol cylinder, 30% glycol percentage, that'd be about 470, 475. So you're gonna, you might find that you have an, uh, maybe another GPM, one more gallon per minute or a fractional gallon per minute extra to, to, to deliver the same amount of heat. Here's one, uh, uh, Gustavo uh, is talking about, uh, it looks similar to something he's seen from Mitsubishi, wants to know if it's all our stuff, 100% German technology, uh, there's the question. Well, yeah, the outdoor unit, absolutely 100% German technology. The control made by Dimplex uh, and, and modified for our use. Everything else is made by Keiko in, inside. We assemble that. We didn't. We don't make the buffer tank. We source the buffer tank. We also source an indirect, a, a real high-performing indirect uh, with an electric immersion heater in the indirect to help us out at really cold temperatures and to do disinfection. Um, those are sourced by us, but we assemble the indoor unit itself. Right. So, and, and, and one of the things about Dimplex too, in case you're curious, is is Dimplex is a company that's been you know making heat pumps for well over 40 years already. Um, and it's not just water to, uh, air to water heat pumps. They also do uh, air to air heat pumps as well. Their specialty is involved in water. Uh, air to water heat pumps themselves. They do love making those things and they do make that controller. So uh, one of the things you don't need to worry about is serial number 001 because serial number 001 was pretty much Mike Miller's house. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we we, 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 we away happily. Yep. Yep. So uh, like, like I have said in many of our classes that uh, we all get to Guinea pig so to speak, for takeout. Sometimes that's a good thing because it's it's the coolest and greatest new technology that's out there, but it's also the baddest thing out there because, hey, guys like me and, and Mike and Rick and John, we travel for a living. So yeah, we go and put in this really cool equipment. We just hope it works when we're not there. <laughs> <laughs> You're not joking there. I can tell you my wife was quite uh, excited about me putting this new thing, dangled thing in that never been sold in North America. <laughs> it's right. great. Yep. Oh boy. So I got <laughs> So, so I'm going to jump back to to almost uh, 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 50 minutes ago with some questions. So Rich had asked, is there a circulator in the outdoor unit? Uh, no, there isn't. So those pictures that Rich uh, that my, uh, John was showing before were the, the tappings that you saw when we saw the, the line drawing of the outdoor unit. Uh, there were two connections come in and then it basically right from there tied into a flat plate heat exchanger. All right, so the circulators are on the indoor unit. So we have a very small amount of pipe on the outside, as well as a, uh, the flat plate heat exchanger that's there. So the, no circulators in the outdoor unit at all. Um, so I'm just gonna go down the line that I'm seeing here, John, if you don't mind. Well, I've got a couple here as well. Uh, Frank Smith asked about max BTUs. Frank, I hope we did. I hope we addressed that in some of our charts where we were able to answer that. Uh, just type in a little something, something, and let me know that we did answer that for you. Because again, that's a moving target, all right? Uh, can we put magnets on the indoor unit like we do on our beer fridge? <laughs> Why not? Yeah, sure. I like it. I like your style. And we are, is, and then a follow-up question, is Taco going to have magnets? <laughs> Great idea. Great idea. <laughs> All right, yeah, your turn, Dave. Have the dark magnets. Yeah, man. So that's actually where I was. I was talking with Bob's questions there, yeah. Ooh, yeah, just yeah. like what Rick has. There you go. Oh, yeah, this is the – well, it's not a magnet. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a um, coaster on your desk, yes. Lick it and stick it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Timothy was asking, it would be have any demo units? Oh yeah, we're just gonna put it on the trailer and just drag it behind the, uh, you know, the the smart car uh, to, to to show around to local distributors. So that's that's still stuff that we have out in the, uh, you know, in the works, so to speak. As as how do we get this information and how do we get this product out to you to to touch and see and. Uh, and, and like John John said before, this is this is early technology for us. This is an early time to bring it out to you guys. Uh, so it uh, goes along with a question is, so how much, right? Yes, how's that uh, right yeah. now? Again, information that hasn't been shared with, uh, with the four of us just yet. Um, so that information and all of our literature is still being worked on. There's a lot, a lot of work being done back at the factory uh, when it comes to doing that. So uh the, the the three of us are not involved in that we're obviously involved in the training port uh, of this so we're building that as we go along so like you said you know like you saw tonight we saw our first introduction into it the thirty thousand with a few touch and goes coming out of it so excellent thank you 
Hey, uh, there's one from Bob Clark that's uh, asking about methanol allowed. And if I'm understanding that question right, is that typically for um, ground source heat pumps? uh for the you know the fluid that's going out mixing it with methanol coming back um mike miller what do you say on that uh it, all we need is some type of glycol uh, water mixture right or what what would he mean by methanol i'm not uh, certain to be honest uh, in my system we utilized a little bit of uh, glycol but it wasn't uh it was just a regular uh, hydronic type yeah yeah yeah, the, I mean the refrigerant in the in the monoblock system is already factory sealed and all that. On the on the water side, it's it's, it's we're looking at a glycol solution, probably about a, again a, whatever is necessary, 20, 30 percent. You don't want to overdo it, obviously. All right, multiple air handlers capable? Asks Rich McGrath. Uh, as as long as the uh, as long as the, uh, the the load can as long as it can handle the load, that's just zoning, right? You can zone to a couple of different air handlers if necessary, provided provided we can handle the BTU load. So yeah, I right. would say yes with an asterisk to that one. Right. Uh, yeah. As as long as one your your cir if you're going to do it with one circulator and zone valves, great. Like I said before, that would be the preferred method. So we have a zero to ten volt circulator, uh, and and we're going to take control of that. But if you're going to go with individual circs based upon the design. Then individual circs it is with a standard uh, uh, SR control switching those circs on and off. So yeah, more than one air handler is more than it's fine. Yeah, definitely. And and when you're looking at air handlers, you know you're looking at those low temperature air handlers. And and there's several. This is a lot of manufacturers out there that are using low temp. It doesn't need to be the 180. So uh, a vast majority of them are doing 120 degrees as the supply water temp. But there's a, a few of them that go even lower. Uh, I was just looking at one earlier today that uh, even has ratings uh, as low as 90 degree fluid temperature uh, sending to the fan coil itself, which and still going to get some BTU output for you. So like we like we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, the lower the temperature, you know, the, the better off you can be with it. So if you know what you're doing and you know how you're designing, you know, get to that low number that you're looking for. So. Rick Coaster asked about maximum water temperature for domestic. Uh, the number I'm remembering is 120. Is that correct? correct. One, we can make 120 degree water with our unit uh, in, the, in the indirect tank. That's why the electric immersion heater in the indirect tank is so important because that is used for disinfecting. It'll drive that temperature up to 140 every few days that you can program how often it does that. Uh, and, and, and you can also program when we regenerate the domestic hot water tank. The tank we're offering is 85 gallons with about 33 square feet of heat exchanger area. That's 25. gonna be the one. No, 35, it was 35. It was 3.3 square meters. Yeah, that's 35 square feet. I did the math. 35 square feet, okay. Yep, yep. Um, so that's a lot. And uh, you, you can use ours, but if you choose to use a different one, understand the electric immersion heater is an important uh, piece that needs to be included, as well as make sure that whatever you choose the heat exchanger has about 35, 33 to 35 square feet of surface area. Uh, that's for that for that recovery for that that exchange of heat. That that's 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 the real critical part. All right, what else do we have here? Uh, do you get domestic hot water when running one. in the cooling oh, mode? We, yep. We, yep. we got that one. There was a question on the indirect, uh, so thank you. Um, and can units be twinned? So right now, based upon the controller itself, as far as I know, it is what we call a monovalent uh, system. All right, so it's not, uh, the controller is not going to be able to communicate with several units themselves. So right now we're monovalent with one unit, yes. So there's the question, what are you gonna do for larger buildings than the 2,500 square foot or 3,000 square foot you might be able to do with one? You'll just possibly size it like you would the furnace, two separate systems. Here's a good question. How do we get people to stop being chicken about sizing? This is from Nate. <laughs> you can usually meet load at two thirds or even half of manual J. I could hold a class on it if helpful. Nate, we might we might take you up on that. Uh, remember, the, boy, oh boy, we we are we are chickens. I think that's a good word, Nate. Chickens when it comes to heat loss. Oh, I don't want the call. I don't want the call. I'm gonna I'm gonna oversize. I'm gonna oversize. I know it. Ashray says, you know, to design to seven degrees above zero here, but boy, I don't want the phone call. I'm going to design to 10 below. All you're doing is, is add an extra fudge that's meaningless. You know, how aggressive can you be with your heat loads? Um, you know, 
understand if you do it, if you take a, a manual J or an IBR heat loss and do it by the freaking number to the letter, all right, no, no built in fudge, no nothing, you're going to be oversized anyway because they take, they, they have to do, they, they have their own built in fudge factor. You don't have to add any extra, right? Particularly when it comes to something like infiltration. That's why when you do something like this, really do a blower door test. That's so important because that's what tells you what the real rate of infiltration is. Any math calculation you do is overstating it because they have to overstate it because they can't, you can't do a blow, you can't do a blower door test on paper. You have to do it in real life. So really be sure of what your heat load is as you go down this path because you will be amazed how many applications this thing will actually handle. Very critical when you size fan calls, right? You got the heating, you got the cooling, but you also got the humidif dehumidification. That's yeah. a big one. That's one thing I wish I had a size to my heat exchanger slightly bigger for that humidity pull it out. Yeah. yeah. Here's one. What about the Johnsons on Cripple Street that need 100,000 BTUs? Can't use this one. <laughs> That's this this heat. This one's not going to do. This one's not a candidate for that job. That's just the way it is. So. I so Alan, Alan had a question here. Is there a controller that can integrate this device with an existing ModCon to choose which device to fire depending upon time of use electricity rates? If, for example, in Ontario, we have uh, a time of use electricity. Daytime, Monday to Friday is peak. Shoulder rates are early. Lowest rates are overnight and weekend. So uh, that is what we, uh, I believe, is part of what they call the smart grid technology uh -huh. that is already built in mm -hmm. now to tie you know, to tie that into an existing mod con no this control doesn't have that i believe but the smart grid will take care of that so to speak yes i and i see so, mike shaking his head like a kind of yes or no type well, of thing it's yes, yes or no because it, it, the control already has an output inside uh, which is a dry contact essentially and in my case instead of having a usual using an electric element in a buffer tank and one in a hot water tank I chose to connect an external boiler to it. I used an electric boiler, but I piped it in series in the flow through configuration from the outdoor unit to the indoor unit. And I have to contact inside from the controller cycling that electric boiler on and on or enabling it. So then the boiler itself will just come on whenever the control decides. And it'll be to supplement it when it gets cold outside. It'll be when, uh, when, when you need to boost your hot water tank temperature to disinfect. The, the smarts is already built into the controller. What it won't do through the controller is if you use, let's say, an oil type boiler that you need to protect from cool return temperatures, that you would have to take care of externally. But the controller comes with a contact that'll turn it on or off. Great question, actually, because talking about colder climates, remember the heat pump can do up to about, what well, is it, minus five or minus 10 um, or, or 20 Fahrenheit, whatever it was. Uh, you can use it for colder applications as soon as you supplement it with a bigger border when you go down to minus 40 let's say right talk to I a guy in Alberta about that just last week mm -hmm. i know it, again with the heat pump i had in uh, my old home it was it was rated to about 25 degrees when it got to when it got to right around 25 degrees it couldn't do anything and we our thermostat actually had the ability to select emergency heat and that enabled the boiler so that's that's yeah. that that's one of those things that might be the the the, the way to go with this as it, as it stands now. Right, yeah. right. Uh, okay. So a question came in from Colby, how far from the indoor unit can be the outdoor unit? All right, and uh, you know, because we have that 0034 circulator in there, um, it is it is relatively forgiving. And if I remember, and I got, Mike, I may have to confer you through, um, but I'm thinking 100 feet was in my mind or 100 feet of pipe, 50 there, 50 back. Uh, well, so uh, that's the limitation typically with a, um, um, a split unit. You, can, you can't be more than 100 feet away from the outdoor unit because the refrigeration line is the limiting factor. In a monoblock system, it really doesn't matter how far you are away from it. Just get a bigger, move more water with the pump, overcome yeah. the bigger resistance. Make the piping bigger, less yeah. pressure yeah. drop. There yeah. you go. Yeah, because yeah, right, yeah, we're not moving refrigerant, we're, mo we're moving water. Right. right. So you don't point. have, yeah. And, and uh, along the same lines, his question was also about vertical separation. No, there isn't. None. You know, so if you want to go, you, you've got your indoor unit downstairs and you need to go, you know, in a two story basement that's below grade, you know, then you can, you know, put it upstairs. Again, it's all about pipe length. It's not about the height. Right. So uh, because we have our system set up for, you know, with your static fill pressure and, uh, you know, 
height or length doesn't matter which way. We've talked about that many a times in this class. So, um, so yeah, go for it. Excellent. Rich Thank you for that. Got that, a, that uh, was a good question, Colby. Thank you. Um, the thermostat. Is there a thermostat that's part of the M unit, or do we use our own? Very that's good a good question. question. Thermostats for zoning only. This does not have a thermostat enable. This kind of monitors its own water temperature and takes care of itself. Thermostat's simply going to turn on your fan coil. Uh, it's going to turn on, open up your zones, uh, but it does. There's no thermostat connection to the air, to the uh, to the heat pump itself. I know where Rich is coming from with this. <laughs> some, some, left, left field tells me something that might be part of the answer there. <laughs> so so I, I, I'm just going to touch on it quickly, just because I believe I know where he's coming from. But but just like you said, the system operates based on system return temperature only. So it's kind of like it's seeing what's happening in the building, kind of like an indoor reset. And with that information, it's able to control the water temperature separately. What they do in Germany, however, the same unit, they, they use it an indoor sensor for single zone applications also that doesn't only read the air temperature only it also reads the humidity level so in europe that controller is actually already set up to use with their indoor sensor for radiant heating and cooling so it'll do dupont control but it, i think that's where rich might have been coming from but in north america we're just using on off thermostats at this point or any kind of thermostat that enables or disables the zone device very good. Got a lot of good comments from Nate Adams. Uh, we find that about half of the homes under 2,000 square feet in climate zone five can be heated with three tons or less. That's a zero to 10 degree Fahrenheit design. That includes Boston, Cleveland, Chicago, Denver, many others. Yeah, I, 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 Nate said it earlier, don't guess. Don't guess on the heat load. Know what the heat load is. Do the math, do the blower door test and really push the design and you'll be amazed at what you can do. I mean, it takes a little testicular fortitude, I think. But uh, you you will be amazed at what uh, what about what you can do. Right. Boy, a lot of questions. We're we're making we're yeah. working our way through here, but man, we're right. Doing all right. So and as as we've talked about before, when we've shown you how to do high, uh, heat loss for hydronics, we show you the the fudge factors, right? You know, especially the air infiltration, which IBR uh, had put together many many years ago, where they built a room in a wind tunnel and they put wind onto it perpendicular in three directions at the same time. Basically, you're in a tornado, and that's the number that we use, right? So we all know uh, that that number, the or infiltration factor, is always much higher than what it really is. What's the R value of the wall? We typically use what the insulation value is. But you know, get to you know, if we if we really fine tune it, you know, if you, if you're going to put a, a piece of equipment like this in there, you you should spend the the, the hour or two or three to do the heat load. You know, because this operates obviously a lot different than a, than a uh, than your modcon boiler, right? You know, which which has your 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 stages in there, ten to one turndown ratio. You know, so you know as it gets colder outside, the boiler puts out more heat. And as you saw with the curves that we showed you today, with a heat pump, as it gets colder outside, it does less heat. So it behooves you to do the math properly and make sure you can you know that it's going to give everything that the customer is expecting. And what are they? expecting other than just heating their home all right and and cooling their home they're expecting you know the efficiencies to be there too at the same time all right so uh when it comes to a mod con boiler and we just slap it on the wall yeah they see some fuel savings is it everything that they thought they were going to get well that depends if it was set up the way it, it should be um so yeah doing that math and, and spending a couple hours doing it and if you don't know how to do it or don't have the time to do it, find somebody that will help you and do it. A lot of your wholesalers will, a lot of your reps will, uh, that can help you out with that information. So let let us help, you know, and, and get those numbers uh, out for you, definitely. And did there, you guys there's a answer the warranty question? Beg pardon? Did you answer the warranty question already? I uh, did I not see that question. Yeah, I didn't see that question. I think the warranty is uh I don't know I don't know if that's been established yet, Mike. Um or if it's if it's one year on on both units. I'm not entirely sure. It would all follow our current standard warranty. Uh, would, yeah, uh, that that to be determined. That's to be determined. We don't have an answer for you on that one yet. Um let's take a look at uh, there's a couple other questions here. Will this will this technology overtake water source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps? 
uh, ground source heat pumps are great, but boy, you, you got to drill holes, right? And it, 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 you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lifestyle investment you know, for, for forever. Um, that's why you're seeing air to, air to water heat pumps specifically have been identified as the, the growth market in heat pumps because of the ability not only to heat and cooling, but also to, to make domestic hot water and to have that flexibility for different types of heat distribution, not just forced air uh, through a hot water coil, but for radiant floor heating, for panel radiators, for different types of, of heating applications. So I, I think the air to water heat pump uh, with inverter driven you know, uh, technology, that's gonna be maybe the fastest growing element of, of the heat pump world, I'd say in the next 10 years, um, it, it, because, it just makes a lot of sense, you know. Well, provided look at the market right today, um, there is more heat pumps sold for residential applications than there is borders now for the last four or five years already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then let's look at the uh, geothermal. Great, great system. But you know, those who've had some experience with it over time, they might have, in some instances, perhaps over a period of time, seen degradating fields. For over a while, they lost some 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 output because the field they lost some tubes in there now think of the, about an air source heat pump if there is any truth to the global warming and i'm not a conspiracy guy but if there is doesn't that mean it get be gets better <laughs> <laughs> our, our source gets bigger doesn't it I, I know it's making the golf season longer and that's a good thing <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway i i saw i did see a couple of questions that could that control be mounted in a living space no it's connected to the unit specifically and there's really no point to having it in the living space it doesn't tell you anything like thermostat you can't move it up or down so it's it's really just a control for the unit itself now but, you do have the well, ability said, yes to put it on your phone get a tablet get yourself a cheap tablet on amazon and and there you go there's a link to it and you're done yeah. yeah, and you can monitor this anywhere on the planet, so you can see what's going on in Mr. and Mrs. Johnson's house uh, 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 anytime, day or night. With your, uh, as long as you have, you've got it registered and that unit's connected to the internet. Right. So, and, and I had a couple of questions that said, does it have to have an internet connection? Well, no, it does not have to in order to operate. It's highly suggested so that information is available to you as the installer, so you can see what's going on with it. Uh, at any given time and and when it is connected you'll also have a lot of data that's stored down on it and if you can't and and then and the system does require a hardwire connection you want to run a cat5 cable from your router and plug directly in there is a plug on the back of the unit if you don't have the ability to get that cat5 cable there there are plenty of wireless bridges that you can get uh, and I and I, I quickly did a Google for a wireless bridge the other day and you know, you can find them for 20, 40 bucks or so, all right, that you can plug into it and connect to your wireless network of your house. Uh, so if you have the wireless, you can do that. But like I said, it does not have to be uh, connected in order for it to operate. It's highly suggested, but, and we've got plenty of, uh, 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 we've got a couple of job sites that, hey, they had the system up and running before there was even internet brought into the house, right? Because the house was under construction. Uh, construction. So we've, we've done a few projects. So yeah, there, there's been a few projects installed. Definitely. So, cool. Thank you. I know yeah, one one advantage of having that connected to the internet is is the uh, uh, the, the 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 future potential for uh, for performance monitoring and troubleshooting, you know, and and in remote service things like that. That's that's a huge huge uh, opportunity uh, downstream here from from here. So that's again hey, another reason why you'd want to have it done. Uh, Randy Berg's on there, and he's saying oh, hey, Randy. might have missed this. <laughs> but can you adjust the balance point for backup heat? It, I'm not sure what he means by that. Balance point. Well, the, uh, it's you you can't adjust it when when your secondary auxiliary heat comes on. Is basically you can disable it to a certain temperature, but generally the control algorithm is will what will decide when it comes on. But to that point that he has, yes, you can designate at what point you want the backup heat to be brought on. Not right earlier yeah. right so the, the 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 way that i was reading the logic in the controller it was saying that if there was a call for heat uh meaning in the buffer tank not a call for heat in the house if there was a call for heat in the buffer tank for more than 60 minutes then the controller says you know what we need to start turning on the immersion heater all right but it has to be 
uh, that the system's been running for 60 minutes and it's not seeing an appreciable rise in temperature getting closer to our target. So that's the, what, what we're looking. So it's a lot of logic built into it. So it's not just saying, all right, well, it's not getting there. So let's just turn on the electric. It wants to not turn on the electric uh, is really what we're trying to say too. It's saying, hey, we're going to try to make heat as much as we can to try to charge up that buffer tank uh, and get there. So if it takes over 60 minutes and we're not seeing the temperature rise, then it says, all right, then kick on that electric element. Um, and then as soon as he sees that temperature starting to rise, and again, taking into account a lot of different factors and calculations and looking at that rise and over time, it says, all right, it's not going to wait till it gets to the temperature that it needs to be. It's going to say, hey, we're getting there pretty good with the two of us together. So let's kick out the electric. Let's see what the heat pump's going to do out of it, uh, for us now, too. So it really wants to, the, the logic is not just kicking it on, run to that, turn off the heat pump. Then, okay, we get to the temperature, now turn off the electric, go back to heat pump. So the, the two units are kind of in unison, but also based upon that section point that John was showing you before, where it hit the outside maximum uh on that curve it says all right you know based upon your application your system uh it's going to have that triangle that it was calculating in there for the electric use um so it, it, it's it's pretty cool it, it it was pretty cool uh to really learn how that worked neat stuff thank you yeah. here's a question out of left field here about it's got nothing to do with heat pumps it's about how heat sensitive are the sweat zone valves i'm concerned about damaging them while soldering them Best way to not damage them while soldering them is to take the motor off. Uh, if you take the motor off, you'll be fine. There's no, re there's nothing else in there that can be that can be damaged. So um, just take the motor off, good to go. On that's on Zone Sentry, that's on 571s, and on Quick Tops. Uh, and I believe the ones that we have on on this unit anyway are threaded valves, or as far as I know. Are you talking about just? I think he was talking about zone valves in general. Okay. I don't think he was talking about. I don't believe Ralph was was referring to anything on this unit, but. All right, and, and Bob threw a, net, uh, a comment in that engineers have no funny bones. <laughs> <laughs> can we connect system M to an air handler? How is that controlled, asked Nate? Again, the the air handler will be will turn itself on and off based on the thermostat and the call for heat. System M is going to just watch the return water temperatures and see what it needs to do and and provide the water temperature that uh, control tells it to uh, I, I, that answers your question Nate let me know but yeah you just pipe uh, pipe pipe you know heat heat you know pipe uh, those those middle two terminals those middle two holes uh to the supply and return in your heat air handler and uh, let the thermostat turn it on that's it great question Nate that's exactly what I got at my house a thermostat turning on a circulator that provides flow to my a coil uh Bob Clark's got one he's saying uh, is it going to be difficult to remove that buffer tank if it needs to be replaced? You know, is it going to be a nightmare like he's experienced with other applications? I, I've never tried to pull it out of that box, but it's a 30 gallon buffer. Uh, you guys that have played with them, I haven't got to play with a boxed unit yet. So uh, yeah, you, you would us, have to. How easy will it be? All yeah, those covers come, come straight yeah. off. It's basically, I think there's about four or six screws on each one of the covers on each unit uh, come right off of there. Now the, the front cover that has the UHI on there, there's a couple of Molex plugs on the bottom that you unplug and you can pull that whole panel off if you need to service anything on the inside. So, um, but we're built, like we said, we're building all of that in Cranston. Uh, we are doing the pressure tests and, and everything like that before it leaves. So you don't need to be the guinea pig on it. We're already getting that done back in Cranston in Rhode Island itself. Uh, as we build it, we pressure test, we test everything before it gets sent out to you guys. Fully designed with ease of access to any of those components in mind. Very good. So there's no there's no crossbars on the horizontal for support. Everything is on the vertical. So you've got you take that front cover off, you have access to everything right there. And I if I remember correctly, from the front side, there is nothing in front of the uh, in in front of the buffer tank. So there's nothing there in front of you right. there um, because the controller that's in there is mounted above it about this high. Uh, and below it is the is the buffer tank itself. So the control uh, interface is actually mounted on the frame from one of the corner supports uh, in there. So, All right. and Colby asks, what's the water temperature range? Need a water source heat pump to operate HVAC in cooling mode? Uh, 
the water temperature range on heating uh, again 95 up to you know technically 140 but but that's heavily relying upon your 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 electric immersion heat and you really that's you want to avoid that at all costs 130 is the practical limit on the high end uh on the cooling mode uh help me out it's 40 64 to 44 44 yep yep 44 yeah. is, is, is the lowest it'll go there uh yeah. the unit looks like a japanese mitsubishi ac heat heat pumps even the placing of the inverter compressor is that 100 percent german technology ask gustavo yes it is uh and glendimpex has been making making uh uh heat pumps in germany for 40 years so this is this is uh this is 100 percent german technology eric's got one about heat only no this is heating and cooling but if you want to use it for heat only you sure can yeah, that's just a pro. That's just a programming thing. Yep. Okay. Many villages on Long Island have 60 dBA limits uh, from the nearest property property line. So that's again a, a good thing. A good thing for us. Absolutely. Uh, where would this be priced versus things like a Fujitsu split mini air to air system? It's going to be more expensive. Air air to water heat pumps going to be more expensive. Absolutely. But you have the you have the domestic hot water. Uh, the domestic hot water. Uh, application built in the ability to make domestic hot water and you can do a lot of other different things if 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 air to air done cheap is all of a, all all a, uh, a project either requires or can afford we're not going to be competitive with that but that's not what we're trying to do what we're trying to do is 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 be competitive in those areas where we have a high performance house that require that that has a lot of needs in terms of of heat delivery whether it's at radiant floor, whether it's just it's just air coils, uh, all, all, and 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 cooling as well in domestic hot water. That's kind of what that's the that's the the market we're looking at. And the other thing too is I've, I was looking up some uh, utility incentives. Have you guys seen these? Different utilities are offering incentives for heat pump conversions, and there are even there are even areas that are no longer allowing fossil fuel permits in new construction. So this is the whole the whole point of, of what we call beneficial electrification, where you know what, no more fossil fuels. Uh, the, the city of Cambridge did it, city of Brookline did it uh, in Massachusetts. Other areas have said, parts of New York have said, no more no more fossil fuels. If you have a fossil fuel boiler and you got to replace it, then you can replace it with a fossil fuel boiler. But if you're building new, no fossil fuels. So what are you left with? This is kind of what you're left with. All right, this is this is where your option is. And to incentivize this, I saw a $10,000 uh, installation incentive for air to water heat pump. It was specifically for air to water heat pump uh, in Massachusetts, provided that you know the uh, an efficiency and uh, uh, heat load inspection of the property has been done and the uh, and the upgrades have been implemented again to get that to get that load down. So there there the, the, the it behooves everybody to, to look for uh, state and utility incentives in your areas to to, to help uh, grease the skids on this a little bit. Big rebates available. What Big what's the uh, HSPF number? Bob Clark asked. Any HSPF numbers? Question mark. HSPF. Okay, I'm, I'll plead ignorance. I'm not Mike. sure what it is. I'm not yeah. sure what it is. Maybe he can type it out. I'm sure it's an acronym. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Let's see what that is. HSPF. Put them. Boom. Boom. Let's see what else we have. Uh. <laughs> Heating seasonal performance factor. Heating seasonal performance factor. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't see any specifications on that in any of the documentation I've seen. Not to say that it doesn't have it. I'm just going to say that I haven't seen it. So. I'm gonna have a quick look at something. I don't think I have it either. No, we got one guy says no one will pay for a heat loss on a re re. You would price yourself out of the job. Okay, then that job we're not gonna get. Uh, I, I, you know, there's you, you you can make those decisions ahead of time, or you can go ahead and you know do the job that you think the, the thing needs to be done. If someone says I'm not paying for that, then you know what? They're probably not a candidate for. To, to to get the benefits of the heat pump. If they're not going to pay to get a heat loss done and then upgrade the home. Uh, if necessary to make it work, then no, don't. It, it's it, it, trying to trying to force feed it is 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 crazy. Don't force it. 
give them what they give them what they're willing to pay for. It's a cast iron boiler that's oversized. If that's what they want, then okay, go ahead. You know, it's a, it, you don't want to. You, you can only hit a hammer. You can hit a nail only so so hard with a hammer, right? So Jason's listening, and he's saying uh, 14 counties in California are all electric new construction. Wow. See that that's uh, and that's not going to go down, people. That's only going to go up, and uh, throughout the rest of the country, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the HPSF, something we got to get our arms around, apparently, for heating on a heat pump. So. <laughs> Nate says California is easy. They don't have a climate. Actually, they have a whole <laughs> bunch of climates. And they have a bunch of mini climates all over the place. Uh, so you can drive for, you know, 20 miles and be 30 degrees different. Yep. But, uh, 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 Nate's, got, uh, Nate's given a blatant plug, but HVAC 2.0 Comfort Consultant collects the info. Comfort Consult collects the info you need to do a good load calculation, lower door, prior energy use, and set points. So yeah, uh, Nate, uh, if you want to look up something interesting, if you're out there, look up uh, HVAC 2.0 Comfort Consultants, and um, that's their job. They kind of do this kind of stuff uh, and make recommendations, etc. So there, that's a. Uh, I'm learning a lot more about uh, about Nate's business, and it's fascinating. Uh, it's a, it's, yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's, you know how they say some guys are playing, some guys are playing chess while other guys are playing checkers. All right. Nate's playing 3d chess in Klingon and I'm playing Candyland. Okay. That's kind of the difference between us, <laughs> you know, shoots and ladders is more my speed and just, just listening to some of the stuff that, that, that Nate, Nate's up to and, and guys like Rich McGrath, some of the stuff they do, I'm kind of sitting there going, I nod my head a lot and try not to look stupid. <laughs> Well, sound stupid. I can if I don't say anything, I won't sound stupid. Looking stupid, I've got no, I've got no control over. That, that's easy. Yeah, we can all do that. Definitely. I, yeah. I, it's one of my one of my go-to moves is looking stupid. So there we go. <laughs> all right. Can this be wired and piped to an emergency fossil fuel system when it gets to that efficiency point? I, I think we, I think we addressed that one already, Robert. I think, but it, the best thing is probably uh, by using a, a at this point using a, a thermostat where you can just disable the primary heat and go to the emergency heat. That's again, how, how I did it in my old home, so. Very good, best part about air to water heat pumps is we don't have to worry about water being phased out unlike refrigerants, that's very true. You're still gonna have the refrigerants outside, uh, but uh, yeah, they, they, get phased in, they get phased in and out all the time. And the thing is, no refrigerant in the house, which is from everything I've heard is not a bad thing. Keep the refrigerant outside where it belongs. Uh, I, I saw a good question here. Do you have a heat only option? We've got one option. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah the, one option. the only option you have is if you didn't want to use the buff, uh, the, the indirect to make it, to have it make DHW, you can turn that off. Um, right. So if you had, say, a heat pump water heater already in your home and you're happy with that, great, go for it. All right. And I, and I, was running into conversations just the other day where uh, um, I, I think it was in Massachusetts where there were incentives to get a heat pump water heater where it came down to the cost of the homeowner at almost zero dollars. So here we're looking at if we were to put a heat pump in his house and he would have to buy the indirect tank or get a heat pump water heater for free, at that point I'm going to say, well, go with the heat pump water heater all day long. You know, if they're going to give it to you. Uh, now, it's not going to have the same COP and the same numbers that you can see out of our unit itself and what you're going to get. Uh, and, and I think from what I, you know, you know, and I, I'm not 100 percent on this. Sometimes you got to learn how to live with a heat pump water heater uh, because you're extracting the heat from the inside air. All right. Um, um, so you got to make sure also it's it's uh, it, it's not too cold, so to speak, in that area. Um, and uh, but. You know, don't quote me on anything when it comes to heat pump water heaters. Um, you know, again, uh, those are things that I'm still uh, figuring out myself too. Yeah, I, I do think we have the ability to, to to program it for heating only. Correct? Yes. So I remember I remember that from the system. M, so, but but it's not a heat only unit that's separate. It's different. It's the same. It's the right. same unit. You just program it the way you need it. Yeah, I mean, basically, the big difference between a heat only unit and heating cooling is the, is a, is a four way valve mm -hmm. on, the, on the outdoor unit. Right. So it's just and that valve's already there. So basically, if we took out the 
that unit, you know, took out the valve and made it heat only, that really wouldn't be tremendous amount of savings. Um, here's one. Uh, the refrigerant we're using is R410A. Is that correct, Mike? Yeah. Yes. All righty. Here we go. What else do we have? Uh, the heating is a bit different than another way to rate performance. I type slow. <laughs> uh okay heat pumps are measured by yep okay it's an efficiency rating okay 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 uh california's easy we don't have climate <laughs> okay uh boy we've got a, we went through an awful lot of questions here guys uh i asked about volt amps with an eye towards sizing backup generators a boiler with a couple of circulators can be kept running at minus 40 c with a 15 watt generator um we have to look up the amp the amperage on these i don't i know we had we got it we had to run uh, you know, we had two, uh, uh, we got a 240 and a 120. Yeah, 240, 241, whatever it takes, right outside. Um, 240 and 120 to both units, then the, uh, then the Cat5 connection and the, then the Ethernet connection. Yep. So I, I, I did pull that data up. So the, uh, the heat pump itself is looking at a 240 30 amp connection. Okay. Um, inside we're looking at a 120 15 amp and, and a 240-35 amp. And if you had the DHW indirect tank, we are looking at a 240-30 amp, as well as a 121 amp. So, got some amperage involved. Yep. It really depends on what you use. Are you gonna use the two elements, one in the buffer tank and one in the hot water tank, or are you gonna use one electric boiler? Think retrofit applications, right? Like looking mm -hmm. at my house built in the late 80s, only 150 amp going to the house. And over here, we have to oversize the breaker slightly, right? So I'm actually got a 40 amp breaker on, uh, on, on, on the outdoor unit. And then the electric backup is on another 40 amp breaker. Well, I'm at 80. I'm running out of amps for the house, right? Like, you know, <laughs> I, 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 thankfully, I got a, I got a cat stove. Uh, in the kitchen, <laughs> so, uh, if, I, if she ever wants an electric one, I'm gonna have a, have a conversation with her. Don't you don't need all those lights, so. Mike. Come on, man. You do not need all those lights. <laughs> yeah, once it gets really cold outside, no TV for you guys, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the heat pumps are about thousand watts per ton. This is a three and a half ton unit, so heat pump should pull about thirty five hundred watts. That's sixteen amps at two twenty. Oh, this is not good. Very good. Beautiful. All right. Beautiful. Well, that was fun tonight, man. That was good. Last call for questions. We're down to about 55 of you out there. Uh, so we really appreciate your time. I hope this was useful. Again, this was, I, I'll, aside from the information that you, you guys might have got, out, I thought this was very useful for us, for, 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 for Rick, for Rick and, and Dave and myself. Uh, to really start to dive into this because this is something we have to learn more of and learn yeah. more about. And you guys have given us a nice roadmap uh, as well of things that you want to know. So these questions are going to help us put together future presentations and training and things like that. So we really are appreciative of your input uh, yeah. so we can learn more and and do our jobs better for you. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased with it. Say again, Mike? Sorry, can I throw out a little plug for, I understand we have some Canadians on the call too? Go, so be my guest. Canadian. Be my we're guest. Gonna be down at the, we're going to be down at the CMPX trade show next week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Dave, our man, is coming up himself. He's going to be there, and we're going to have that uh, system M available for display. So please come see us. We'll be happy to show you. We'll take the walls off and look inside. Hey, cool. dude, I, am, I am so jazzed to get to that show because, you know, obviously I was going two years ago, and it got mm -hmm. canceled, and I was about to drive there. I'm like, I don't care. I'm getting to that show. Four <laughs> years ago. I was supposed to go to that show and that show four years ago was just today well yep. no today four years ago prevented me from going to that show so Ooh. for those of you that don't know um four oh, years ago, God. Today, yeah <laughs> it's my anniversary today man happy anniversary dave I no know, i know it's not an anniversary that i want to cover you know that i want to celebrate so to speak but it has it, it is a it is a celebration of sorts uh, for those of you that don't know, I did have a heart attack four years ago uh, today, believe it or not. Um, so and it, it it changed my life. So uh, um, I am I'm ecstatic to be here and I can't wait 
to get to that CMPX show. Let me tell you, man, that is just go. that is one of my first yeah, goals right now to get to that show. I was so upset two years ago that it was canceled. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Dave, I got to tell you, I remember the day you had a heart attack. I was on vacation and you almost ruined my vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks a lot. <laughs> Uh, no anyway, uh, we've got a good question here from Gustavo. What are we covering on the eight-week session? That's our factory training class online. So we're going to start with heat loss, <laughs> kind of very appropriate for what we talked about today. We're going to talk about how, show you how to do a manual heat loss uh, with uh, with all of our, all the paperwork, etc. Do it the old-fashioned way. Then we're going to transfer to or uh, transition to. Uh, turning that heat loss into heat emitters. How do we use the heat loss to size and install different types of heat emitters? We're gonna get in, you know, whether, whether it's cast iron radiators, whether it's all that other stuff, I mean, we're gonna get into a, a, a deep dive into that uh, with, a, with some uh, emphasis on low temperature hydronics now. I think we have, we'll be adding that. Uh, when we get, then, then we get into uh, piping, pipe sizing, pump sizing, uh, circulator location, air control, uh, then we get into uh, a kind of advanced pump sizing for different types of applications. We'll be talking about ECM technology, uh, piping up different kinds of boilers. I mean, we'll be doing all kinds of, uh, of different applications. We're going to talk about, uh, uh, I don't know if you're going to get into buffer tanks a little bit, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's eight intensive weeks. Uh, if, you would come, if you come to the factory training class, it's, a, it's about a two-day program. Uh, if it is a, uh, otherwise it's eight, 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 uh, eight Wednesday nights that, uh, that will be, that will be with you guys. And where is this, the, 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 the Canadian, that trade show, Mike? Is it in Toronto? Yep. It's in Toronto at the Metro Convention Center downtown. Our, if an American wanted to go anyway, could they do that? 100%. We're happy to right. be open for business. Borders open. All you need is a rapid antigen test. And even that, only another two weeks. As of uh, April 1st, no more testing to come across the border. Unfortunately, Dave, you'll just miss that. But I sent you an email earlier set up for testing at the show for, for your trip home. Uh, and, Dave, and, and Dave's the kind of guy, he'll study for that test. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right. I've been already. Yes, that was him of today too. Yes, <laughs> I actually, I, I actually had a fun because they needed 24 hours in advance. Can't be 36. Got to be 24 or less. <clears throat> driving, and I'm actually driving from Rhode Island. Uh, actually, from Connecticut because I'm over the weekend. I'm going to be at an OESP board of directors meeting, uh, and so from there I have to drive back. I'm actually going to swing by, drop my daughter off at college, and continue along the way. So I had to find some place to get a test done. So there's a couple of places right in Buffalo that I can do that, uh, and hopefully get the answer within a half an hour um, before getting to the bridge. So uh, I'm I'm looking forward to it, man. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Cool. Cool. All righty. Hey, thank you so much, everybody. We appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. We appreciate you hanging out now for two and a half hours. God bless you. Thank you so much. Two and a half hours of uh, of of good hydronics talk, which is that's that's the best way to spend any day, as far as I'm concerned. I can't think of anything else I'd rather talk about for two and a half hours than the good old fashioned hydronics, man. I like it. I like it. All righty, folks. We will see you hopefully uh, April twentieth. Uh, be on the lookout for registration uh, information and uh, keep your eyes peeled for the system M. I mean, we're going to be looking for that, uh, that that should be hitting our shores sh uh, shortly, and we'll be ready to take orders and start selling it's come June, I guess. Um, so, going to be it's going to be a great product, and we're really really excited about it, and hope you are too. And uh, any qu any specific questions that you that pop up, please feel free to 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 reach out to myself, Dave, Rick, or Mike, uh, and um, we'll do our best to find some answers for you. Awesome. Any Let me last words of wisdom from you, from you all? I'm just going to uh, add my email. I'm going to put it to a, to a chat question right now that uh, Alan had posted. So I'm just going to send it out there. So if anybody has any specific questions that maybe that we missed because there was a crap ton of them coming through and I, I think we tried to get all of them. But if you have any pledge, my email address, please send them on over. I will. Uh, uh, if I don't know the answer, I will find somebody that does, like Mr. Miller and 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 those back at Takeo. 
uh, in regards to that. So, but again, I do uh, do want to say thank you all for attending the winter sessions with us. This was a lot of fun to do. Uh, a lot of stress, a lot of stress, you know, hey, you know, uh, trying to teach some new products and new stuff that we have and new ideas. Um, but I uh, wanted to make sure we we sent the best available to you guys. So hey, I Jay, do want to say talk thanks. About that, talk about that stress. I'm going on vacation again next week. Do not have another heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> it would only be Miller-induced if I had I will. I, if you have a heart attack next week, I'm going to be really <laughs> mad at you, man. <laughs> yeah, I think I will be too, yes. Yes. Hear me more than the cardiologist, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, awesome. thanks, everybody. Have a great thanks week. Thank you guys for having me. Appreciate it. And thank Good. you, Mike. It was, it was awesome having you, man. Take care. Well, this is mine. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Enjoy. Bye.